Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of February 21st, 2013. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight. We're going to open with uh, public comment. Uh, before uh, we start, there's a three minute clock. Uh, the public's allowed to speak on any topic for each individual is allowed to speak for three minutes. And um, we will start with Latanya Robinson. Good evening. Um, on behalf of the Northampton Human Rights Commission, we want to offer our thank you to the council for your leadership following the recent horrific assault in our city. Um, your recommendation, President Dwight and Councillor Freeman Daniels, and the entire council's support of the resolution regarding hate crimes are exemplars of the people and actions that indeed make Northampton Paradise City. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is particularly relevant as we consider this assault and our response. In Article 1, it states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should, be, should act towards one another in a spirit of butter, brotherhood. Article 3 says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. I am confident that we will continue to be a wonderful, inclusive community, a place where there is no sanctuary for hate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Zimmerman. Thank you. I'm Bob Zimmerman. I'm president of the Broadbrook Coalition, the organization that manages, together with the Conservation Commission, the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. And my remarks tonight will be very brief. I just want to speak in favor of financial order. It's number three on the agenda tonight. Purchase of 21.4 acres in Broadbrook, Greenway, Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. This is an important acquisition. It's a small acquisition, but an important one. I don't, I, I guess you don't allow for visuals, but uh, I can pass this around if you're at all interested. But um, the green on this map of the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area is the existing land. This strip, which is the proposed purchase in uh, pink or orange, is the land in question. And you can see that this will fill in a gap. We always seem to be filling in gaps uh, in the north-south axis of Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area on the southern spine of Horse Mountain. It provides- Pass that around? I'm sorry. Pass that? Sure. I have my notes on it too. So. Thank you. <laughs> um, it provides a connection for an important north-south corridor, which um, is very beneficial to animals living in that area. Um, it will secure that corridor. Uh, it borders over a short <coughs> uh, length with the Broadbrook itself on the east-west side of the Broadbrook. Uh, interestingly, it's at a point where there is a small, very small blue heron rookery, but it's a growing one. We see more and more nests every year, so it will help protect that. And there's a little bit in um, a lot 734, which is disconnected with the main uh, property we're talking about, but uh, that little piece of land borders on Kingsbrook, which is a tributary to the Broadbrook. So it's a valuable piece of land. Uh, the Broadbrook Coalition has agreed to uh, contribute $4,300 to the purchase of the land, and we're very excited about adding that to the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. Are there any questions? Unfortunately, we can't ask you questions during public session. Oh, okay. But, and we'll get you back your, uh, your AV notes here, too. So. Thank you. Okay. Um, Marjorie Hess. Uh, my name is Marjorie Hess. I live at 70 Masonic Street. Um, I'd like to thank Mayor Narkowitz, City Council President Dwight, Police Chief Sinkowitz, and the entire City Council for the strongly worded hate crimes resolution unanimously supported at last Council meeting. 
I serve on the advisory board of the Human Rights Commission. The commission was established in 1998 and is charged with advocating for the human and civil rights of all people in Northampton, residents and visitors, and for educating people about human rights. We've always been fortunate to have the support of the mayor, the city council, and the police department. You have more than demonstrated that support with this resolution. We, we thank you. A vicious attack took place in our city. My first reaction was, this is Northampton. These things don't happen here. As others have said before me, it is so easy to get complacent. We not only respect diversity in our wonderful city, we welcome it and we celebrate it. So when something like this happens, the only response is to speak out immediately, forcefully, and uncompromisingly. And that is exactly what you have done. I thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, that's the end of the list. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak today? Then I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Present. Councilor Dwight? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Here. Councilor Clark? Present. Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Spector? Here. Councilor Tate? Here. I'll accept a motion for the approval of the minutes of uh, January 31st. So moved. To approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Um, <coughs> this is the, the resolution that was just mentioned uh, in public session. And uh, this is a second reading for approval. Uh, does the council wish me to read it again? Yes. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of City Council President William H. Dwight and Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels. This is a resolution regarding hate crimes. Over the weekend, this was several weeks ago, a man was assaulted on Strong Avenue here in Northampton with terrifying ferocity. He was struck in the face with a viciousness that no decent person can comprehend. And the blows continued even after he lost consciousness. The police are investigating and there are few details available to make any determination regarding the motive for this crime. There have been concerns and speculation expressed within the community that this attack was a hate crime because the victim is a gay man who was leaving an event at a bar on Strong Avenue that was advertised as gay friendly. It is important to emphasize that no determination has been made regarding motive and the investigation in the assault is at its earliest stages. It is premature for any official to say otherwise. That said, regardless of the outcome of this specific episode, it is appropriate and imperative now that we assert in the most emphatic way our abhorrence for crimes motivated by bigotry. A hate crime when it occurs is an affront to the ethos of this community. It is an assault that injures the victim. But more than that, it is an assault on the members of the group that is being targeted and by extension, an assault on the entire community. All crimes that leave victims are considered by us to be repugnant. <coughs> in hate crimes, there is the added element of an expressed contempt for the virtue we cherish, thus amplifying the offense. Now, therefore, be it resolved on behalf of the City Council, Mayor Narkowitz, the Chief of Police, Russell Sinkowitz, his personnel, and the citizens of Northampton, the Northampton City Council emphatically declares that the City of Northampton will not abide attacks, be they verbal, psychic, or physical, on any person because of who they are or who they are presumed to be. Anyone who commits a hate crime in Northampton must know that they have no sanctuary here. Uh, is there any discussion? Actually, is there a motion? I'm sorry. Move second reading. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of passing this in second reading? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll come to the point where we have one minute announcements. Any counselors have some information they wish to share with the community? Gracious. All right. Yeah, really? <laughs> uh, let's see. What's up next? Appointments. Three minutes. No appointments. No. All right. So what are we up to, Mary? Licenses. Oh, we're going okay. We're going to recess for finance. Uh, we did approve minutes. We did approve minutes. But you were trying to get online. Yeah. What minutes did we approve? Minutes were approved. Uh, um, so we're going to recess for finance, and I'm passing the gavel to the chair of finance committee, 
uh, Council Murray. So, Mary, can you read the <coughs> Here? Here? Present. Here. So uh, several issues on the uh, Finance Committee agenda this evening. Um, and the first one um, is related to snow and ice, which we are all well too familiar with at this point. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 44, Subsection 31D of the Massachusetts General Laws, the Northampton City Council approves the expenditure of funds for the purpose of snow and ice removal in excess of funds appropriated for such purposes in the FY13 budget. To approve. Uh, any discussion on this one? As you all remember, we, you know, we, we can do this if we appropriate at least as much year to year, but we hit the jackpot. <laughs> we hit the jackpot with snow this year. We're hitting it again this weekend. Yeah, we probably will get some more. So uh, any, any more discussion on this to send it to full council? All in favor of a positive? Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. <coughs> Took that. That's mine. Here. And the uh, the next one is on the recommendation Maybe. of the Conservation Commission and Councillor Marianne Labarge. Uh, whereas the open space recreation and multi use plan uh, 20115 2018 recommends that the Conservation Commission add to protected conservation and agricultural preservation restrictions along the Parsons Brook and Park Hill Road area and whereas the owners of a key portion of this area Daniel and Penelope Burke have agreed to sell a conservation restriction permanently preserving a 19 acre uh, acres abutting an existing conservation area uh, for $9,500 and whereas this purchase will be funded from existing community preservation funds, donations and grants and no new appropriation is required. Now therefore it be ordered the City Council hereby authorizes the City of Northampton acting through its Conservation Commission to accept said conservation restriction and hereby approve said conservation restriction. Move recommendation. Second it. Second. Um, Councilor DeBarge, you want to, this is your, you want to speak to this? Yes, I would like to. Um, these 19 plus acres, I have been on it many, many times. And Bob and Helen Dostal, who also has a tremendous amount of property in back of their homes, kind of like connects with these 19 acres. I've been on the property, on the Burke's property, and I can <clears throat> tell you the wildlife that is on that 19 acres. You'll see, I, I've never seen so many deer in my life. It's just absolutely beautiful. And at the Dostal's home, they have in their dining area, a picture of that whole back area of all the deer. And I just wanna forewarn the counselors that we do have a conservation area on Park Hill Road. And I know Councilor Carney way back, we approved accepting that conservation area, which was quite a bit. This also will be like a connection of protecting this conservation property. At 9,500 is very reasonable because that property could be developed and the family doesn't want it to happen. They prefer seeing it staying under conservation, agricultural, if the house is ever sold, whoever buys it will never be able to sell it for development. So looking at this, this family's losing money, but they don't care about that. They want to keep that restriction on there so that it will never be developed. But I, I'm just saying you have to see the property. It's beautiful. <clears throat> Through the chair. Please. Um, Councillor, it's hard for me to see on this map, but what's the proximity to the landfill since this is Park Hill Road? Oh, that might be a little bit better. Is it is it on the other side or is it? Yeah, if you go on to their property, there's goes the 19 acres. So I don't, it's really not that close. I mean, our property is closer to the landfill. Okay. Thank you. Because Thank you. in back of our five acres, we have Swazlowski's property, which is 28 acres. Mm -hmm and quite a bit of conservation land out there. And you were referring to the previous conservation restriction that, that was 
purchased some way back on Park Hill Road. Yes. <coughs> um, move to recognize <coughs> Wayne Fiden. Yes, I make that time. move. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Something specific, or I just chat about the property? Chat, you know, just, just <laughs> make you work, work for your time here. So it, it is a gorgeous piece of property, as, as Councilor Bard said. We now have two conservation restrictions along Parsons Brook to the east of this property. A conservation restriction that sort of is along the southerly boundary, and then an agriculture preservation restriction that goes out to Park Hill Road. So it's one continuous piece of property. Maybe I'm just guessing, but maybe half a mile from one end to the other. So a large continuous piece, um, and this is not in Parsons Brook, but there is a lot of wildlife that moves from the field to Parsons Brook and back out again. So it is valuable from that standpoint. Um, just one minor request, if I could. Um, Councilor Murphy read the the uh, order exactly what it was. It's not supposed to be the year whatever that was. <laughs> so if you could drop one of the ones, I'm hoping. <laughs> You can crack oh, my type up. 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a bonus digit in the order. <laughs> a very long time for <clears throat> Councilor Barch. And Wayne, which I, you heard me explain to the councilors, I mean, they could make money on this property. There's no question about it. Because you're looking at that 19 acres, 19.5, 9 how much they could do with a subdivision on each lot. They're losing a tremendous amount of money. And, and I want to thank them for doing this because it's such a beautiful area. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, uh, Director Fiden, who who's going to hold this conservation restriction? So the city will hold this. The city will hold The yeah. Conservation Commission will hold it? Or? That's correct. Okay. It's because they own the property. That's right. They'll, so they'll we own the property. We need somebody else. But when someone else owns it, we can hold this here. And th there's no, will there be any maintenance required on the property? We walk the boundaries once a year to make sure there's not, and, and the property once a year to make sure there's no encroachment. But so. there won't be other, other than that, there won't be paths or anything. No, that's correct. Thank right. you. This is private property. There's no public access. You know, we have the right to, to monitor it. But other than that, we don't have the right to go on the property either. Yes. Also, to say that they end up selling their home and whoever buys it, they only can do agricultural and whatever on that, right? They, they cannot do anything else. That's correct. On this, they own some additional land as well, but on this land, you're absolutely right. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So any more comment on this order? Okay. Then uh, in finance, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. <coughs> and we have another open space. This is the Broadbrook one that was spoken about in public comment. Whereas the open space and recreation multi-use plan 2011 to 2018 without additional digits recommends linking conservation areas along Broadbrook to enhance wildlife value and create a contiguous Broadbrook Greenway end, whereas the Volunteers have agreed to sell 21.4 <coughs> acres for 21,400 to add to the Broadbrook Greenway Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, subject to them holding limited and temporary timber rights, and whereas this acquisition will fill a major gap in the middle of the Greenway, fulfilling a top Conservation Commission and Broadbrook Coalition goal, and whereas all the funds will be drawn from CPA conservation funds and community donations, no additional appropriation is required for this purpose. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the Conservation Commission is authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire for conservation and passive recreation purposes as provided by Section 8C of Chapter 40 of the General Laws and the Community Preservation Act and Article 97 of the amendments to the Massachusetts Con Constitution, any fee easement or conservation restriction as defined in Section 31 of Chapter 184 of the General Laws or any other interest in the above land and any immediate adjoining land that the City Council hereby accepts such conservation restriction that the Conservation Commission is authorized to grant conservation restrictions on any land so acquired. Move to recommend. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, discussion on this one. Councilor yeah. Dwight. Uh, Wayne, you want to pop up again? The, yeah. um, <clears throat> this is relative to the, to what extent is the timber rights? Is this selective cutting or do they clear cut this? So it's selective cutting. Um, Conservation Commission may in fact want 
it pulled back to an earlier stage of succession. Um, but it would, you know, the the process is the city actually hires a forester, so we're in control of making sure it's a qual and and the, the standard is um, consistent with the long term health of the forest. Okay, so the the city has oversight on 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 the selective cut. That's correct. We did a, a similar, not identical, but a similar process. The land just to the south of us, which used to be owned by the Keating family, um, they cut just before we purchased it. We didn't oversee it as much because they cut before we took title. And we've done this elsewhere, the La Palm property in Menorah Hills Conservation Area. He retained a timber rights for some number of years afterwards. So we've done it before. It's a, it's a way for an owner to get some more money out. It's a way for us to get it at a successional stage that we're happy with. And, Everyone's happy with the process. I believe it's five years that he retains the rights to cut. Council Bar. Yes, thank you. I'm a little confused with that, Wayne, because <laughs> it says this is giving the volunteers the rights, okay, of them holding limited and temporary timber rights. So they could go in and just cut. With so, this language, that's what it sounds like. So the, the, the language that, that we have will be the city will hire a forester and identify th how the cut takes place. And, and you know, it will be a, a commercial cut, but it will be a commercial cut that leaves enough healthy trees behind that we have a healthy forest that stays. Um, you know, Conservation Commission isn't trying to say all land has to be con conservation forever or has to be untouched. So, you know, a timber cut is not inconsistent with conservation values that's out here. Um, so we spend less than land, they get it, you know, money out. Um, it, you're basically talking about one cut. Whether they do it this year or three years from now is going to depend, frankly, partially on what the market is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the timber rights, it just means that the family receives the proceeds from the cut. Is that right? They're actually the ones who hire a forest, they hire a logger. They'll hire, but you'll, it'll be the specifications of the city. That's correct. And they'll receive the, the proceeds. <clears throat> That's correct. Mm -hmm. Councilor Carney. Thank you. Um, I've always supported uh, purchase of land around the Broadbrook, uh, around the Fitzgerald Lake. And, and um, this is straight in line with that. It looks at, when we looked at the um, map that was passed around in this one here, that's clearly a gap, right? Right. There's land that we have above it to the north and to the south. So I will, when this comes to the full council, support this. And in terms of the timber cutting, I, I understand the councilor's concern. Um, but if we don't purchase this land, they can cut everything to the ground as they will right now. So it sounds like we're at least getting the the five years. After <coughs> five years, we'll you know have complete control over what is cut and um, be able to limit that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, how can you not say support this? You know, because looking at the mapping and the connection, we're putting it all in place. So how can you say no on this? Councilor Tacey? <clears throat> I want to spend a minute. I, we're talking about timber cutting, and I want to take a minute to talk about the Volunteer family. Uh, I don't know if anybody realizes just exactly how much of that land they own up there, but they have been absolute perfect stewards of land. You couldn't ask for people that cared more about land than they do. And when I saw in here that they were going to retain <coughs> timber rights, I didn't even blink an eye. It would be, they, have, they breathe this land and have, and they have kept that land pristine. Um, for, I want to say, about 150 years. Um, both sides, actually, the tim a lot of the timber that was cut off of that land in 1951 or two actually built the big red barn on the right-hand side. It's all built out of oak. It's a beautiful structure. I mean, and it's, it's, a, it's a friendly purchase, which is perfect. I spoke with Grace and uh, Bobby and... This is, um, I, I support this, and I don't have any problem at all with the Volunteers holding any timber rights or anything such as that for any period of time because uh, they would never, they would not do anything to scar the land ever. And so, mm -hmm. and they're great people, and you, you could, they're second to none. Mm -hmm. Another fine steward of the land is La Palm. Mm -hmm. 
on Sylvester Road. Yep. So, um, I, I support this 100%. So, in finance, all in favor of a positive Aye. recommendation? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> so, upon the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz and the Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use, order that whereas the proposed uh, <coughs> grant of group assisted living project meets the requirements of 402 CMR 2.10 subsection 3, and whereas the proposed Grantham Group Assisted Living Project is consistent with and can reasonably be expected to benefit significantly from the inclusion in the Village Hill, uh, the Village at Hospital Hill Economic Opportunity <coughs> Area. The project will not overburden the city infrastructure, utilities servicing Hospital Hill, and the project has a reasonable chance of increasing employment opportunities for residents of Northampton and the Greater Franklin County Economic Target Area. It is hereby ordered that the City Council approves the Grantham Group Assisted Living Project as a certified project within the Village at Hospital Hill Economic Opportunity Area and grants a tax increment financing, which is a TIF plan for a period of 15 years with a 25% TIF exemption on new growth value beginning in FY14 or upon commencement and completion of construction and authorizes the Mayor to execute and implement a TIF agreement. The City Council further authorizes submission of the certified project to the Massachusetts Economic Assistance Coordinating Council. To recommend a second? Yes. Second? All right. Discussion? I think the mayor would like to make a little presentation on this, and the mayor's always <coughs> recognized. So, Thank you. Good evening, uh, members of the Finance Committee and, and other members of the City Council as well. Um, I wanted to... Uh, I. I <coughs> wanted to come before you just to talk a little bit about the TIF and the chronology of this. Um, so some of you may know that, uh, well, last summer I, I had the opportunity to, I, I had the opportunity to meet with officials from uh, Christopher Heights who've been in discussions with Mass Development about developing an assisted living project on Village Hill, um, which was actually a very exciting development because it's assisted living has been part of master planning at Village Hill uh, from the very first master plan. We had always uh, tried to hold a space on there for an assisted living project, even through all the various iterations of the project. It's been one of the goals. So um, it, 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 was, uh, it was exciting to have them come forward and also the fact that they offer a very unique assisted living model that also satisfies other goals at Village Hill, namely affordable. So in September, I um, received a formal request from uh, uh, Christopher Heights or the Grantham Group, which is their, their parent company, uh, for a uh, tax increment financing um, package. I, following the city's procedure, uh, came to the Committee on Economic Development, Housing and Land Use, had an initial meeting with the members of that committee uh, to get a sense of what the, the sort of the pulse of the committee was about this, to get their guidance before I negotiated and brought forward a proposal. Um, by way of background, uh, Christopher Heights, and you'll hear about this a little, in a little bit, has developed projects in other cities in Massachusetts for other projects, and in those communities, um, uh, enjoyed uh, TIFs with those other communities. TIFs were a pilot, and in many cases, they were significant in, on the range of 70 to 80 to 90 percent TIFs. Um, that has not been the custom in Northampton with our TIFs, and that was part of our discussion that we had in October. Um, I did provide just a brief kind of history uh, for them at the time, kind of an overview of what the history has been in Northampton. Um, we had traditionally done 5 percent uh, TIFs. Generally, they'd been shorter term TIFs, five year TIFs. Um, we did those for uh, Big Y, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, Wright Industrial Millwork, uh, the Northampton Airport, and State Street Fruit Store. Um, in 2009, we expanded the length of those TIFs. We did a 5% TIF for Cole Morgan. Um, and then in 2010, uh, which is our most recent one, we did give a, a somewhat larger TIF. Uh, it was a 13 year to Coca Cola which was a 50% in the first seven years and 25% in the remaining six years, though I would say that was one that we, um, we initially had pursued the standard 5% TIF. We received word back from the state because they were offering other incentives as well as funding. They were asking us to 
provide a larger TIF in order to get their certification. So that's the one outlier. So, um, so the takeaway from my meeting with Ed Lou was to try to pursue something closer to that, uh, <clears throat> to what we had done as a standard. I came back to Ed Lou after discussions with um, with Christopher Heights um, with a with a kind of a unique proposal in that I was. Um, asking to offer them a 25% TIF over 15 years. Um, but then parallel to that um, was, was applying with, um, with Christopher Heights to the Community Preservation Committee for uh, funding for the 43 affordable units that will be constructed as part of the project. And we were requesting specifically $120,000 in funding um, and as I tried to fra as I framed it to the Edlu committee, the, uh, the the looking at the tax implications using today's tax rate, the value of the property, um, and sort of taking that out 15 years, the total sort of static value is 150 thousand um, dollars. 20 percent of that would be 120 thousand dollars. So what I was <coughs> attempting to bring or bringing forward to them was sort of this two-pronged <coughs> approach. We would grant the 25% TIF, but then we would be applying as well for this CPA money, 20, which would provide sort of an offset for 20% for of that TIF. Um, so that was the proposal that I brought before Ed Lou in January. There was robust discussion. Um, uh, Ed Lou was not able to make a recommendation at that time. Um, I then asked to come back before the committee uh, last, well, in February, and brought Mr. Ohanian with me at that time um, to really talk about why uh, a 15-year TIF was important for their business model, and uh, and upon further consideration, Ed Lou did vote uh, to recommend that I bring this forward to you tonight. So you'll notice I'm bringing forward the TIF, and then right after it on your agenda is a CPC recommendation for the uh, $120,000, and you'll note in the resolution it's contingent upon the TIF. So the two things are sort of linked together. Um, Councilor. <clears throat> in that this is a unique structure mm -hmm. and an approach, how does this register on the books relative to how, how does the state view this? Okay. Um, well, it, we're not we're not really we're, we're not uh, in terms of the state. We're again, I've tried to emphasize uh, we're we are submitting a 25 percent 15 year TIF to, right, no, I'm and, sorry, to the Commonwealth uh, and then to the the allocation of CPC funds. Sure. I mean, I, I tried to make the analogy at Edlu that we've many times, well, first of all, the city has been an applicant for CPC funds many times for city buildings, for city projects. We have them pending for city parks. So the city is a valid applicant and can receive CPC funds. You may also recall that we've many times, Mr. Fiden's come before you, um, where there's a piece of property that's an open space piece of property that's in tax title and there's a tax debt that's owed by someone it's a lien on the title and we've basically applied for CPA monies and used that money to pay off the tax you know to sort of pay ourselves off to, to satisfy the tax debt so that we can then take that lien off the property and the pro property remains in open space so um, it's comparable to that where it seems like it's you know we're, it's an Sort of, we're moving money from one pot to another, but that's a, it's still as long as the underlying ration, the underlying project in that case open space, in this case affordable housing, uh, you know preserving a park, preserving rec field, you know whatever it is, the city is a valid applicant for those funds. So that's the um, that's the rationale that we're taking with this. And, and you're comfortable. <coughs> this qualifies. <coughs> All the criteria. Oh no! I mean, uh, uh, you know, the CPC folks were—they were ecstatic about the project. They were supportive of the project, and had you know, if the TIF part of it was not involved, they would be equally supportive of it. It's not really—I mean, independently, it stands alone. I believe it stands alone, both as a CPA project and as a TIF project. And I'm gonna—I'm gonna turn it over um, to Mr. Ohanian because he's going to talk about sort of the specifics of the project because I think. When you learn a little bit more about the project, the investment that's going to be made, the jobs that will be created, um, and then again, this really unique affordable living, assisted living uh, that it's going to provide, uh, that gives you a better understanding of why I think it's an important project for I'm, the city. Councilor Labarge, do you have a question before 
Yep. Yes. Presentation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your question. That's if oh, Councillor Dwight is finished. Oh no, I'm I'm fine. I was going to recognize sure. Walter Ohanian, but that's I have a question too before. Um, Mayor, you're absolutely correct because I can recall way back of the plans that were apparently being put in place and the talking of assistant living hopefully occurring at the Village Hill. My question is with the CPA money, and as long as I've been a counselor, I've never seen CPA money being used for a project like this is it because of the affordable housing most definitely thank you that is the that is the, the that is why it's being considered uh, because of the affordable units and i got a couple of calls yep, on that and exactly. I, them, I said it's <clears throat> definitely affordable housing and 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 the other thing i would emphasize um and we can you know discuss it further is you know we've we've uh, i know we've talked a lot about cpa dollars being used to um to create affordable housing and um, the statistic that I shared with Ed Lou um, at the last meeting, um, and I just want to pull it up because I think it is really relevant. To date, CPA funds have created 39 units of affordable housing. Um, this is going to create 43. Um, although, actually, I'm going to stop there because we're, we're not talking yeah. about the CPA resolution. Actually, well. Councillor Kearney has a question yeah. before we proceed. Councillor Kearney. Thank Carney. you. Um, my questions actually are around the... Um, the TIF, yes. and the criteria, the, the Northampton criteria mm -hmm. that were <clears throat> established under the previous administration. Yes. I think when you and I were both serving on Edlu. That's correct. And um, I just, uh, you've had long discussions, I'm sure, with the Gratham Group, and I want to make sure that there are some of these that we're, you know, we're being sure that we adhere to, <clears throat> such as um, um, we know that there will be jobs and I think you said there will be a you know more detail about that but also in terms of the building that we're committed to using local construction for lo local contractors for construction and repair and we have language in the we have language in our standard TIF documents mm -hmm. that that talk about uh, well obviously trying to hire you know try to hire local people to the extent possible we can't I don't believe we can we can require that there's also language in our TIF documents that that um, also mentioned this issue of of um, encouraging the use of, of local contractors on construction, et cetera. Yeah, I'm reading um, from the document that's on our website. Exactly. So that is part of what what we put in our standard TIF agreements. Again, we are not, you know, we can't by law bind someone and say you can only hire a Northampton contractor. That's just not allowed under procurement law. But we certainly can encourage that. And I know Mr. Ohanian is going to talk mm -hmm. in his presentation about their commitment to, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, the, and the fact that they'll be employing local people. And and, uh, and so I'll, I'll I'll let him talk about that. Okay, so and just on the historical um, aspects that you mentioned, I think it was Coca-Cola that we ended up actually having a clawback. Mm -hmm. We we took back money. That was an original. That was the uh, that wasn't this existing TIF. It was it was one that was in the Ford okay. administration. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the original plan. So we do have that ability. We, we most certainly do. And again, this gets certified by the state and, and it has to be um, certified by their bo approval board. And then there's an annual requirement that they check in with each company and, and they do monitor these things. So yes, it is, uh, it is looked at. Thank you. Um, any, other, any other questions uh, before the president? Council to recognize Walter Hanian for, for yes. the second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillors. Um, my name is Walter Rohanian, and I am the Managing Director of the Grantham Group, and we are proposing an 83-unit assisted living community. I have a question. I'm not sure how to move the slides around. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate very, very that. Very sophisticated. Sir. Sure, yeah. <laughs> so Christopher Heights in Northampton, as you can see, is an 83-unit, three-story assisted living community and it will be 52% of the units will be affordable. And they'll be occupied by residents who earn less than 60% of the area median income, and that's determined by HUD. Out of those 43 units, 17 of those units will actually be for residents who are at or below 30% of the area median income. So 26 will be at 60%, 17 will be at 30%. So the very, very low income residents will also have an opportunity to live there. Next slide. 
The project is going to create jobs. Actually, it's going to create 40 permanent positions. It's roughly a $13.4 million project with about $8.6 million in construction <laughs> built over the course of 12 months. And that's going to create roughly 65 construction jobs. The project will make purchases from local vendors, different areas, raw food, maintenance repair, landscaping, snow removal, transportation, advertising, administrative expenses. The project is committing to affordability. When we're, what we're applying for is, besides what we're applying for here, our financing revolves around low-income housing tax credits. And as part of the low-income housing tax credits, beyond the 15 years of this TIF, in our tax credit application, we're committing to affordability to affordable units in perpetuity. So what is assisted living? What types of services do you offer? So we offer personal care, and that's personal care that includes help with someone who might need help with bathing, dressing, medication reminders. This is actually going to be the fifth assisted living that we developed. We have ones in Worcester, Webster, Attleboro, and Marlboro, Massachusetts. The company started back in 1997. And what happened was we had realized that there was a need between someone staying home and a nursing home. So this is that in-between step. What's the, what's the type of person that comes into assisted living? Well, the average person that comes to see us is around 85 years old. It's about our average age in our communities. It's about 75% female, 25% male. And something's happened. They don't just wake up one day and say, geez, I'd like to live in an assisted living community today. Something's probably occurred that they need to come to this type of community. And that could be maybe help with medications, could be help with getting dressed could be just the peace of mind knowing someone's there in case something does happen. So the services we offer give those people those peace of mind, knowing that they have the services that are available there, and that there is someone there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, awake staff. We offer three chef-prepared meals a day, and I'm going to show you pictures of what the buildings look like inside, and you'll see the nice dining rooms as well. Like we talked about, the on-site 24-hour staff, and the medication reminders. We have a wonderful daily activity program. And these activities could be a variety of things. It could be a morning exercise program, current events. It could be going out to <coughs> restaurants, to the theater. It could be something simple like bingo. <coughs> a variety of activities that we have within the community. Whenever I give a tour to a resident, to a family, I always tell them, if there are three things that I can do, you'll see a different, hopefully you'll have a different person in three months. If I can make sure you get three chef prepared meals a day, three nutritional meals, Make sure you get your meds on time and the socialization aspect of it. It's a huge component in assisted living. These residents are vibrant, they're active, but they're in the building just to make sure that everything goes okay for them. We offer weekly laundry and housekeeping, an emergency call system. Each room will have a pull cord. If there's ever a need for assistance, they pull the cord. Staff carries a beeper. It's not like you might see in a nursing home or in a hospital where it rings outside the, the door. It's very personal, so we don't want them to ever be alarmed of pushing that. Once they pull it, it could be something like they might need help with getting a glass of water. Or it could be, God forbid, they, they might need help with, since they've fallen, then we're there to make sure that they're okay. And we also have a nurse and a social worker who's on staff as well. So where is it? It's going to be at Village Hill. And if you, <coughs> I'm sure most of you know the site, obviously. It's going to be behind, in front of the male attendance building, or on this picture, behind the male attendance building, and in front of the community builders building. So it's going to be on the corner of Village Hill and Musante, excuse me, and Village Hill and Mosier. Okay. When you come in, you'll see the little drop-off area, the circular drop-off area that we have for the residents there. And that's how the building will lay out. The parking will be on the left side, as you can see, and on the front side, uh, that will be some parking that will be for the male attendance building. This is the scope of how the building will look. Like we had mentioned, it will be roughly three stories high. There will be some nice architectural pitches to it as well. And then also some brick that will be on the first floor from that side as well. The nice thing about it is being three stories, it's not overbearing for the complex. It could actually fits in quite well to where it is. This is the side that you'll see on Village Hill as you're coming in. It's the east elevation. 
And then this one here is the north elevation. This is where you're going to see it from Mosier Street, what the community builders will be seeing in those apartments. So you see the brick actually goes all the way up to the top, which I think enhances the look of the building itself. And then lastly, on the other side, you'll see how it's going to look from Musante's side. Okay. This here is a picture of, of what typical of a common space looks like in the building <coughs> itself. The building will have, as soon as you walk into it, we try and have a, a nice bed and breakfast type atmosphere. You'll see a nice living room, a fireplace, the rich blue carpets, a sitting area where the residents will go and chat with each other, read the newspaper, read a nice book, and see who's coming and going through the front door. It's something that they really enjoy. It's a home-like feel. It's the fireplace. And like I would mentioned, it's that bed and breakfast type of setting that we have in, in making this their home, making this their living room. In here, we call this our pub area or our coffee bar area. It's actually our main activity room. As you can see, there's a chess game that's been set up over there. Um, it's the area that we use for the main activities as well. So what we try and do is have a, a one common area for the Reds to be able to have a large amount of the activities that we discussed earlier. The nice thing about it is when you come into the community, you can feel the vibrance and you can feel the energy of what's going on. It's the common space that people come to meet at. So they always know is if they, let's say after breakfast, they go back to their room and then they'll come down around 10 o'clock and they'll enjoy the social events that we have planned for the day. One of the things that we had discussed was the, the dining rooms. This is what we call our country kitchens. Some assisted livings you go into, there's a main dining room. And our building is going to be 83 apartments. So if you have 83 residents that, that come in, into one dining room and you're the new resident moving in, you have 83 heads that turn and that can be kind of overwhelming for somebody. So here you're eating on the floor in which you eat, you're eating on the floor in which you live and it's a nice setting. So you're eating with roughly 30 to 35 people in each of the dining rooms. We didn't go out to eat every night as, 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 the, as, as people. We always, a lot of people eat at home many nights. So we tried to give a home-like setting in this country kitchen I think has been successful in that. This next one just shows you what, what a typical apartment would look like. This here is a studio apartment that you'll see. And you can see where the bedroom area is there. And then on the next slide, you'll see the sitting area that we have. Nice by the window, which will be bringing lots of light for the residents. And then another type of unit that we have here is one with a bay window. And you can see the bump outs that we have in some of the buildings. It's nice because it gives extra light that you have come in. And also architecturally from the outside makes the building very appealing. So that's a little bit about our building and the services we offer. So I always get asked the question, <coughs> what makes your community different than other communities? Well, this here is a flyer that I have from Marlboro. When we were with one of the <coughs> other meetings I had come to, I, I had given one from Webster. It's something you'll see in all of our companies is you never have to worry about running out of money at Christopher Heights and never have to worry about moving because of that affordability component. So someone could come in and have the resources to be able to pay for assisted living, or someone might not have the resources to be able to pay for assisted living. Either way, the resident, it's one standard of care. The resident gets the same care. In addition, if their, if their funds do run out, they stay in that same apartment. Even though it's 43 low-income units, at times we might be 45 low-income units, 46 low-income units. What it means is I could just never go below the 43 units. That's the commitment that we have made. In addition, let's say I was living in, in a nice room and I was a market rate tenant. Well, just because my funds have run out doesn't mean now I have to move to a quote unquote a low income unit. The rooms actually fluctuate sometimes at their market, but if the funds run out, then they could be a low income unit as well. When a building is up and actually built, this is what our Marlboro one looks like and it's the basis of how we have planned the one for Northampton, it's gonna look something similar to this. And thank you for your time. Any questions? Councilor Labarge. Yes. All right. This kind of reminds me of the labor problems up on East Stanton. Okay. And a friend of mine, they had donated all this land so that could happen there. My question is, you said something about if an individual lives in an apartment but runs out of finance yep. okay so that's how you're going to go ahead and rent off an apartment by your income 
Is that what I'm hearing? So what happens is a resident can live in a low-income unit if they qualify under the HUD guidelines, either 60% or 30%. So 43 of our units qualify under that. If a resident came in and happened to have the funds and the means to be able to pay the full assisted living fee, they might be in one of the 40 market units that we have. Okay. But if, let's say, a year down the road, a year and a half down the road, their finances run out, they would, we would qualify that unit as a low-income unit. The resident would still stay in that same exact unit. It would not have to move to another unit. What would be the cost? For somebody who does have income, how much would that cost sure. you monthly? If, if it's a market rate resident, it's going to be based on the you know, economic factors in the area. Right now, assisted living services in this area are roughly $4,000 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, uh, Mr. Haney, and I, I um, I know we, we spoke at the Edlo meeting. I remember. And I did not <laughs> expect to, to uh, see your presentation again. But um, since I got another bite of the apple, okay. I might as well take it. Um, I have a couple questions. One, maybe you can repeat uh, what you said at the Edlo meeting, which okay. was why a 15-year TIF is sure. so important to you. Yeah. Um, the, the main reason why the 15-year TIF is important is we have, so this building is built with low-income housing tax credits. So we have to ensure that we, ha we can meet our financial obligations during the life of the project. But obviously for the investor in the credits, it's extremely important for those 15 years as well. So it's going in and knowing what our expenses are or having a better idea as to what our expenses are going in. It's a very high operational budget. Roughly 70% of our costs go into staffing and making sure that the residents have the staff that they need on hand to help take care of their needs. So in addition, so it's important for us to know year in and year out what our expenses are going to be. It, I don't have, out of those 43 low-income units, the reimbursement that we're able to get is not sufficient enough to meet the costs that go into a building like this. You, you, I mean, you're a, you are a for-profit entity, though. Correct. Okay. So, so I mean, you're. Okay. So that's that's question one. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I answered it to my satisfaction. Sure. Um, did all of the other communities that you've built in Worcester, Marlboro, Attleboro, and Webster did they all also grant 15-year tax increment financing? I either had a TIF or a pilot agreement that lasted 15 years or longer. 15 years or longer, okay. So they, they all, the rest of them all did. And then you say that uh, you're going to do local purchasing, raw food, advertising, Correct. maintenance, stuff like that. You said this at the, at the Edlu meeting too. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, using the economies of scale, you, it seems like you'd probably make local purchases in Worcester, Marlboro, Attleboro, Webster. Do you have any? cash flow statements, purchase orders that you could show sure. us to show that in Worcester, you ordered in Worcester, and right. in Marlboro, you ordered in Marlboro? Typically, and I think I had mentioned it last time, and I don't know if I brought it with me, it was roughly 800, I think, thousand dollars locally that we had, we, we spend. It's the ballpark as to what, the, what it is. You, but you've shown that to the, you've shown that to the mayor? No. You showed it to, could you show it to us? <laughs> I, um, I, there's nothing to hide. I'd, I'll have to go back and, think, and talk to people about it as well. I'm curious as well as about the construction jobs. Okay. Because we're going to do two readings anyway, so you've, you've got a few weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilor Spector, did you have a question? Oh, if my voice holds up. Actually, I'm going to ask <laughs> Councilor Freeman Daniels, who disagreed with me on the committee, to uh, give my point of view here, if I can. Um, I, I would like, I, I did support this um, in Edlu. However, I do want to hear again. Um, I love the presentation. I think we all agreed it's a great project. I, I need to hear more, though, about why you need the TIF. Because actually, just as everyone remembers, usually a TIF, we provide, say, 5%. The state provides 95%. So the bulk of the financial um, 
gold mine or tempers, whatever that is, but usually the state is providing a good deal more, and they're not providing it here. But that's usually the reason people go for TIF, okay. is because it's a really significant amount of money not coming locally, but coming from the state. And that's not the case here, both in terms of how it's set up, because there is no state money coming. But it doesn't seem like that large an amount of money. It is from our end, but in terms of your whole project, number one. And even though I did support it and I, I spoke against uh, Freeman Daniels' argument, when he just brought up why not the five-year, um, I, I didn't hear quite the reason. I know you need to do the long-range planning, sure. but you would actually get more money in right. those five years. So right. you could do your own planning, so right. making your argument for you. You could take that money over five years, right. which just as you're trying to protect yourself to say, look, for we need to understand – in the long term, sure. what our financial right. flow is going to be like. Correct. The city, which is your, your case, also needs to look at what is our long term flow. For, so it would probably be advantageous for us to do this in five years. And I guess I, st I want to hear you make that argument it, it, once it, again. I, I think kind of like, you know, you had mentioned it, it's, you know, Counselor, it is, it is I have to make sure <laughs> the, the credits have a ten, 10 years of credits for the investor and then a five years compliance rate that they have as well. My obligation is to make sure that the project continues to be able to support its debt. It's even beyond the 15 years, obviously. But the most important part to me is the 15 years. And that's the, that's the reason why that I, I need operationally need to know what, have a good idea of what the costs are going into it. And, and that's, that's the whole reason why. Doing it in, in a short amount of time isn't long enough for me to be able to, to, to to, to take a chance. You know, I can't take a chance in six or seven years that there's not enough revenue coming in to be able to support the expenses and the cost of, of the full obligations that we have. Do you have a projection of what the yearly operational expenses are going to be? I do. I, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have it in my head, but yeah. I mean, obviously, there's a whole pro forma and a whole budget that goes in. So maybe a couple of those things, since we're doing a second reading, sure. it might be helpful just to have those. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Councilor Casey. Yeah. <clears throat> just a couple of um, the off we have office space on the, the first floor or Correct. office space throughout? Uh, office space throughout. Okay, and all the floors. And laundry facility and things such as that? Throughout. Full basement? Uh, there will be, right now the way that it looks, there will be a half basement. And that's where the, the main kitchen will be. And also the mechanicals. Okay. And I guess my next question is, with the CPA money, which is... Northampton taxpayer money. Is this, is there, I'm not trying to say that, uh, I'm not, I don't want to take that out of context. Do you have people waiting in the wings in the city of Northampton sure. for uh, assisted living because we're going to utilize CPA dollars from Northampton tax, but I'm just curious. There, we had a market study that was done, and there is, without a doubt, a demand for assisted living, and in, in particular, low-income assisted living. Okay, and is the low-income tax credit, housing tax credit, is that tied right to the TIF? You get income tax credits. It's just the TIF is not in. You would get that anyway. The tech, the tech, I don't believe the tax credits in the TIF have any tie whatsoever. I, the building has to be built. The building won't be built without the tax credits. I don't know yep. if that answers your question. Okay, yeah, it does. Okay. And um, the average stay? Sure, good question. The average stay of a residence is about two and a half years. Two and a half years. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> uh, on page five here, it, it says provide housing for households with incomes below 80% of the area median income the extent to which includes the number of such units and the percentage of such units in relation to the total number of units in the project. How does that relate to if someone does lose their finances and you're going to end up, they're still going to be able to stay there. Absolutely. Because they still have. I just find that, that, whole, that statement a little on the confusing sure. side. Sure. Yeah. Once again, if their funds are depleted, that's not an issue with staying at the building. That that's the beauty of, of what we have here. There's 43 low-income units. So then, the percentage of such units in relation to the total number of units in the project could change. It could go higher. It can never go lower. It, it kind of like I had mentioned. Let's say I had my 43 low-income units yep. that were filled, and my 44th and 45th resident had run out of money that were in the building, 
I'm not going to say, well, you have to continue to pay market until you can go on to our low income program. They just go on to the low income program, and it's an extra unit that I have that's considered low income. But with the two and a half year average stay, there's always some. There's always some attrition. Up. So you yep. go from column A to column B, and an incoming person maybe yep. is at market because you've just created another low income unit. Correct. Councillor Adams, did you have a question? No, I didn't. Thank Councillor you. Dwight. Uh, the process of transition, you, uh, as, as people transition out, they usually um, go to systems that require, if they're no longer being, you can, can no longer manage them in a system limited Correct. capacity. Right. Uh, do you guys offer services for transition? Yep. And, per and particularly for people who become indigent? Sure. In the so, so like I had mentioned in the presentation, we have a social worker that's there as well. So she helps with residence adjustments as they move in and then also with discharge planning. So it could be to another type of setting that is more amenable to be able to take care of their needs. And that could be a nursing home, long-term care. And unfortunately as well, we do see residents who obviously expire within the building. And what are the criteria for review for uh, for qualification for assisted living? Sure. And disqualification for yep. assisted living? Uh, a resident, I explained to the typical resident that comes in, a reason why a resident would have to leave in our building is they could have short-term memory loss, but long-term care memory loss would, would be an issue. Um, they couldn't be a wanderer because this is not an Alzheimer's right. unit. In addition, they can't be more than an assistive one. They can't be a two-person assist. And they also have, can't, can't have a continuous skilled nursing need. If they had a skilled nursing need and they were bringing in the VNA to help with maybe wound care or something, that would be fine. But if it's something that's continuous, they would need an alternate type of setting. And uh, I have a question for sure. you because I was not uh, privy to the Edlu conversation. What is the term and what sort of instrument is your, your, your primary funding for this project? Low-income housing tax credits. And what sort of term, you know, you're talking about a 15-year TIF. How does that relate to the term of the tax credit? Okay, so what happens is when, you, when you're awarded the tax credits, the tax credit investor has, a, they're, they're there for the first 10 years as they get the benefit of the tax credits, and then five years thereafter they have a compliance period. So they're in for the full 15 years. For the full 15 Correct. years. Correct. Which would be one of the primary reasons why you want the TIF to cover the same period. Correct. Uh, Councillor Tacey, did you have another question? Yeah, I'm pretty sensitive to um, the CPA funds um, that are generated in Northampton and going to this project. <clears throat> You wouldn't, by any chance, need space or something for a different project that you have. And as this were to be constructed, would you move? Would people come from an, another project to this project? I, my assumption. And I see that what happens sure. with affordable housing yeah. all of the time. All of a sudden. Sure. Our market, just to kind of give you an idea, a, a typical resident will move in. The primary market area is four miles. The secondary market area is eight miles you're going to be getting 85% of your residents between those two markets. So someone coming from Worcester to, to Northampton, unless it's a family member, is most likely just, just not going to happen. My, my, and my concern is we build affordable housing. Everybody's welcome. You know, sure. <clears throat> don't take this anyway, but in the way that I, I'm, I'm putting it out there. Okay. We build... 10 or 11 or 12 or 15 units here, sure. there, or wherever, for because we show that there is a need for that particular market. Correct. And then all of a sudden, that particular place is full. Right. And it's people we've never seen before. Right. So, so it, and if you use CPA dollars, the people right. that in the city have hitting to put this money out. Sure. That's my concern. I, I, you know, I might be throwing hammers here, but uh. like, like I'd mentioned, our primary market area is within four miles, which obviously is going to be within Northampton. Our secondary market's about eight miles, and then the rest is from there. But to, to kind of give you an idea, it, it could be, you know, if you live in Northampton, it could could be your mom. Maybe you're bringing your mom from Worcester because you want her to be closer to you. So that's why she would she would come to our type of building. Also, Dwight. I, I I think to that point, first of all, if you're living here, you're living here. Correct. Now, whether you're from here or not. And the other point is that there is a critical need because what we have is people on fixed incomes who are aging out, and this is our demographics closing, our cohort close, uh, approaching that much quicker, and that uh, you're going to see 
the reason that assisted living systems are blossoming like mushrooms after the rain all over the country is principally because the inventory, for lack of a better term, is increasing as well. And it's within the shed of the community. And part of the appeal of assisted living systems is for people who actually wanted to stay in their homes but were unable to, people who live locally, who cherish the community. And we're, we're not like Florida. People aren't making this a destination point because of the climate, clearly, because we have the next storm coming. But the fact is that these are people who want to be located here. And the, the cohort of aging people qualify as uh, in the affordability spectrum because <coughs> of the fixed income pressures that we've all experienced in all our wards is that, that, that uh, people who bought their house for $40,000 now find it assessed at a much higher value because it is considered to be worth closer to $400,000 by somebody else. The pressures are there. There's no income coming. They're, they want to stay within their community. And this is why these type of systems become remarkably appealing for people who can no longer afford to. They're not making the money anymore to offset these things. Um, it's, so the ethos of, a, of an assisted living center paid for by tax dollars of Northampton residents may see people moving here for this purpose of coming into this affordable system. I actually don't think that's wrong. I think that's essentially how that's how that's how that's how it works <coughs> all over the country. It's, I, I I don't that would not be a criterion which I would evaluate uh, a TIF award myself. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Um, just going over some of the issues that were just talked about. How much will this property? give the city for new growth on taxes what at least about 70 or 75 um, percent <throat> the uh when you say gr growth what yes well, it, um, this project uh right now I mean, it's going to bring in money it's about 2.8 million dollars is what it would be assessed at so okay. um if it were built and running right now um that would represent about forty thousand dollars in tax in, in new tax revenue um, to the city. That's what again using today's dollars, and if it were up and running today, um, based on what the assessors have told us, and they use a formula, they they look at the entire project, and then they actually they have it they discount because of the affordable units as well. So that's a formula that they use. Um, I'm going to go to Council Adams. He and our, go ahead. That's a substantial portion of our new growth. That's, that's projected to be a substantial portion of our new growth. Uh, it, would, it would definitely add to new growth in that particular year as, as we look at what, what new growth is from year to year. So when a new building gets built or, you know, um, you know Cole Morgan or any of the other projects that are coming online. And, and I think the, the thing I want to stress as well is, um, you know, this is a, this is a, a good company, and I've, I know that you asked about what I've asked for in terms of details. I've talked to the mayors in the other communities. They have nothing but high praise for them. Interestingly, um, Congressman Jim McGovern yep. was involved in getting in one of their first projects in Worcester. He's toured their facilities extensively. He's now our congressman. He speaks highly of them. Um, uh, you know, I, we can certainly try to get additional information, though I will say I don't think we've ever in the history done a, you know, a, um, forensic audit of where they've purchased goods, but we can certainly ask for some additional information on that. I don't know that we can require it, but we can certainly ask them about it. You say it's a benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's a benefit, but it's not, I mean, I'm saying it's one of the benefits. It's not tied to the TIF in terms of there's not, it's not a requirement that, I mean, the key thing is creating the economic growth and the, and the 40 jobs are the key things that they're bound to. So, um, and then the other thing I just want to point out, the property, the one point, uh, one plus acre site is not generating any tax revenue right now. It's not generating tax revenue. It hasn't been, um, and it you know until we develop that site, it won't. Um, so I just that's another reason why I think it's important for us to to consider this, and that's why I brought it forward. So, thanks. And again, I just want to point out to councilors that we do have the published. Um, document on our website which is the city of northampton guide to massachusetts economic development incentive program 
which is consistent, uh, the, the Northampton criteria is consistent with the state's criteria in terms of the most important criteria is the jobs creation piece, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and what we specify, we go on to clarify that in the Northampton criteria to say that these jobs will be secure positions with desirable wages and benefits. So I'm leaving that to the mayor's office and the economic development coordinator to ensure that those are meaningful jobs. And um, it sounds like that in that category, they're typically, sure. you know, desirable wages and benefits, yeah, full-time jobs correct. with benefits. Yep, that's correct. Yep. Council Lubarge? Yes. Um, there's no question about it. Assisted living has been a huge concern with many people in this city. I hear it. They have owned their homes for a long time, and taxes go up. It's becoming more difficult on the income that they're making. I, uh, to me, it's the best way to go. Great. Okay, that's how I feel about it. I feel that knowing that they don't have to go into a nursing home, and there is a difference, okay, with assisted living. Sure. 24 hours a day of protection. You have your nurses, and looking at that almost remind me of the Lathrop Home in East mm -hmm. up, up on Florence Road. It's like there's security there, and it sounds like with the socialization that's going on, I, I just feel that assisted living is a desire to our community. And how can you say no? Because we do need it. There's no question about it. Councilor sure. Freeman Daniels. Well, when I say no, I'm not saying no because I have any problem with the project. Uh, and I, I brought this up at Ed Lou, and I'm going to bring it up again. Um, the, the council does not have uh, the, the minutes from the last Ed Lou meeting, but uh, I was in the minority. Um, and uh, and I'll summarize for Councillor Spector, who I don't know if you noticed, but he is still sick. Uh, what what the what he said at the uh, during the discussion, and also my my points. And um, I'll start with Councillor Spector's points because it, they were they were good. Um, they were poignant, and I took them to heart. Which was that really this is a conversation about our values and what we care about. And um, he he quite rightly pointed out that we're, we're losing money on the federal level, we're losing money on the state level when it comes to sponsoring good projects like this. Uh, and it, it takes the kind of creative thinking that the Grantham Group is employing in order to get assisted living facilities for low-income people uh, in, in, in built uh, and, and, and accommodated. And uh, that, that, am I, am I? Yeah. My you, characterizing argument? You could be my press secretary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my, what, what my concern, uh, I brought it up at Edlu, and, and uh, I have a concrete proposal for you today. I did not have one at Edlu. Uh, my concern was the, the length of time being 15 years. And the mayor and I basically are, are, are bickering over numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he's got a good point, and I, I'll, he's recognized so he can defend himself, but I'll just say that. Uh, he, when he presented to us the, uh, his analysis, <coughs> the, the keeping everything flat, the assessed property and the tax rate, um, a, a 25 year over, I mean a 15 year period of 25%, the, the total, um, the CPA, which is a fixed cost, was roughly $8,000 a year. And then the city had another um, was was on the hook for about five percent, the, the the CPA covering about twenty percent, and the city covering the extra five, the two together making up twenty five percent. So the city had a rather modest portion, roughly two thousand dollars a year, for fifteen years, roughly thirty thousand dollars. So m my argument uh, is that it's very unlikely that in this in the city of Northampton which raises its taxes by 2.5% every year, that it, the tax rate or the property assessed value will stay the same for 15 years. Uh, the mayor and I, are, we have a disagreement about exactly 
what that, what that assessed value might be or what that tax rate, rate might be over the next 15 years. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's very difficult to guess. What I did was I just, in, I just increased the property value by 2.5%, which is not, a, is not a very accurate way of doing it because we could have overrides or we could have increases in property <coughs> elsewhere in the city. But with that, with that calculation, the city was um, putting out m more like 50 or, or $60,000 instead of the 30. So we're, we're arguing about maybe 20 to $30,000 extra. Uh, so it gets worse, however, for every for uh, for the longer time horizon, it's okay. Uh, you know, you can you can guess about taxes in a in a short period of time, but uh, changes in property value, changes in the tax rate, future overrides, and so on, over the next 15 years, it's very difficult to guess. And I think the risks to the city of of uh, assess of of losing revenue, or not really a losing revenue, but really assessing it to other taxpayers, is significant as you go out for 15 years. So my proposal for this for the committee is to strike the 15-year 25% TIF and make at a five-year 85% TIF, which is actually more money over those five years than the mayor's calculations over 15. It's actually roughly $180,000. Whereas the mayor's, if you recall, was roughly 150. So I'm, I'm giving, I'm, I'm offering the council a plan which limits the, our long-term risk from 15 to five, and actually gives more money to the Grantham Group by roughly $30,000. And what my argument to Mr. Hanian is, he can capitalize that benefit in the first five to supplement his next 10. We're giving him more money, which can be capitalized very easily. So that, that's my proposal to the committee. Now, can I, just for purposes of information, since I'm a former assessor here, um, ap apply this to the, the formula you've just presented to us. The 2.5% does not affect the value of the structure. It affects the levy. So. The, the value of a building that's going to be, you know, it's a commercial property, it's going to be valued by its income. If half the unit, roughly half the units in the building will be low income to the tune of 60 to 60 percent to 30 percent, then half the income in the building is going to be below market. So its assessment is unlikely <coughs> to change in any substantial way <coughs> since it's not really market-driven numbers since so much of it is affordable. So if the value of the building doesn't change, you know, if you're compounding 2.5% on the value over the long term, it, it's going to be a lot different than if you value it by the income approach and that value doesn't change a lot because so much of it is income restricted and it's unlikely the value is going to grow. So the levy may come and go. But where the tax rate is figured by the relationship between the levy and the value, which of everything which floats, and this building is so income restricted, it's not going to change that much. It probably isn't going to have the same effect as if you took and started compounding by two and a half percent the value of the building. Then, it, then we would be subsidizing more and more and more. But I don't see the value is changing since it's figured on its income, and its income is not going to change that much because half the building is income restricted. So I, I don't really don't see it as that profound a problem. Based, you know, if you apply the two and a half percent. The way you have to the value, it's going to matter. But if it's on the levy side and the value stays the same, it's really not going to matter that much. The, the, the mayor, do you have something that? No, I just wanted to say, and I, I you know, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't call what we've done bickering necessarily. <laughs> um, I, I, but I, but I do think, you know, the the committee gave me instructions, and the way the TIF system works is the the mayor negotiates with the applicant, and then I have to get the council's approval of what I've negotiated, and. Um, and after the first January meeting, I did go back to Christopher Heights, and I, and I did say, would you consider a more compressed time frame um, as opposed to the 15-year? And they, uh, as you've heard, were fairly strong that the 15-year was an important window. 
And so that's why I asked him to come back to Ed Lu and tell you himself why it was so important. So, um, and I, again, I don't just, I mean, I think anytime we grant a TIF, we never can say with certitude what the value of the TIF is going to be. I mean, when we gave 15 years or 13 years to Coca-Cola, you know, again, 50% over the first seven years, 25% over the remaining six years, we didn't assign a dollar figure to that or, I mean, we just, we know that's what we're giving them over time. We, we approximate, but again, we, all we can use is the here and now. So I'm just saying I get that and I'm not, and I've always been very clear that I was not, that this 120,000 was never, you know, a true representation of what 20% would be because um, no one can really predict that. Um, I don't really know that there's a formula you can apply to predict that. So I guess I would just say, you know, I would hope that you would apply the same standard that we've applied to all the other TIF projects as well. That, you know, so anyway, that's that's my take on it. Other, um, uh, other discussion and points? Councillor Freeman Dana. I, that's a good point. I thank you for, for that clarification. Um, I, at least at Edlu, they told, they said that the, they believe that the property would be assessed residential. That is, I believe it will be residential. It will be a residential Half class, but be. valued by by oh, in, okay. because by, of by the rental income. income. Yeah, so which be, half of it is yeah. not? So yeah, so yeah. it would be you know when we look at commercial, industrial, personal, it'd be in the residential category. But it will be by income, but it would be valued by income and, because it's an income. And the income. assessor said it would be valued at four point six million if it was just straight apartment, eighty three unit apartment building. Yeah. But it gets but cut it, in half as for. Right. Of the but it'd be valued by the income approach, even though it's residential. And you don't think, I mean, remember that this is a, a for-profit entity, 70% of which is operating, of, of their of their costs are operating expenses. You don't think over 15 years the cost of, the, the cost of labor is going to increase? I mean, I, I think that, I think you're right, but I also think that we're going to have, they will have, they will be increasing, I mean, we can see in, in in other in other facilities, the cost of of the of a stay increases has has increased uh, over. Uh, I'm not sure about about the Grantham Group, but uh, in other facilities, they, it increases sometimes five or six percent. The cost of the of the pro, of the of living there. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I, I don't I don't know. Yeah. What I'm saying is I think yeah. I think we should lower the risk. Because mm -hmm. what if we're what if we're wrong? On 43 of the units, we can only go, we can only increase by what HUD determines the, the increased rent limits will be. Just a and, that, and that's why when you value them, you get messed up because the, the, the income stream from those units is artificially depressed by regulation. So they have to, with, with roughly what's 80 some odd units, so roughly half of them are in some manner income restricted. Correct. So the ability of the value of the building to, to go up as dramatically as a market rate building may go up over that 15-year period is, is seriously, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's restricted. So it's it's not likely to change as much as a market rate building would. Um, uh, Councillor Tacey? yeah, I just want I want to just clarify one thing too. When I talked about the CPA dollars, their local dollars, and what happened is we developed with millions of CPA dollars in the center of Florence. And with 50 units, and only ended up with two people from Northampton. So that's my concern, my sensitivity to CPA dollars, which is local money that we pay. I just, that, that's my sensitivity. So I'll just I'll drop it. Then I just want to make sure. I just don't want to. Councilor Dwight. Um, not on that. It, point, but uh, it, it, uh, I think we've 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 had that point. Okay, I was just gonna say if it does help you at all. A lot of the referrals come from the Council on Aging, come from. Uh, the senior housing in Northampton, and also two from the rehab units from the area nursing homes. Just to, just to give you some sort of comfort level. My vote will be a good faith vote. Yep. <laughs> Thank I you. Just, I, I'd like to say that actually I'm very grateful for the two, the two analytical minds here who yeah. have the capacity to understand this. So that when I'm way out in the weeds, when when I'm starting to talk about influence, the 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 and of course, the original I was actually on the council when we authorized the TIF for Coca-Cola. And um, at the time, of course, TIFs <coughs> are provided to promote development and to create jobs and expand and reinforce value in the community. They're also, they're one, once again, one of these little convoluted mechanisms that we put in place because we try very hard not to say that we're increasing taxes or trying to ask people to pay into 
what we call uh, uh, essentially a social service debt where we're paying for the services that we want. So we come up with very exciting and creative ways with various acronyms in the TIF, Tax Incentive Financing is one uh, that was established because regionally uh, the Northeast is becoming depressed and there wasn't a lot of development, there was not a lot of new buildings, so that they decided the, in the infinite wisdom that our legislators and our governors passed came up with this concept that was been in practice. And you see, I mean, unfortunately, you see this, these incentives offered all over the place, financing films that aren't made here and things along that line. This, this actually, and I think it, speaking more to the point about what Council Freeman Daniels is talking about and Council Specter and Council Murphy about the, the duration or the extent, how long this serves, and, and I'm very grateful for the conversation that I was just allowed to listen to <laughs> because it really does, it makes sense. Also, your input, of course, is, I, I, and I think what we're trying to do is get a sense of the temperature of how critical it is for you sure. uh, given yep. a short-term concentrated TIF sure. or a longer-term drawn out TIF. I, I explained the reason why it's a longer term, but also one of the things I, I just wanted to mention as well is part of the application uh, for the tax credits, one of the things they do look for is local support. They want to make sure we're in communities that want us. Right. So you know, leverage for, 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 for your application. Correct. Yep. Do they make a distinction between the length of term for the TIF? No, not on the, no. So they, they want to see that there's local support. Councilor uh, Speck. Can, I just want to thank uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, too, and that I hope everybody understands what he's looking at is kind of an insurance policy for us to protect to protect us the same way you're looking at the long-term piece sure. to protect your business correct and I look at the amount of money here both for the city and for you and although it's from some perspectives we could say it's a lot of money from the kind of operating budget you have yeah. and from the operating budget of the city it's not a large it, it's not a huge risk either way I, I don't know if uh, the counselor came to you with his newest proposal or if you guys heard what it was as you were sitting there because you were speaking what he was basically saying look we'll put some more money out front in the first few years make it a little sweeter make that pot sweeter um because i do understand what the counselor's saying i also understand what you're saying does that have any appeal okay yeah, sure well I mean, it, it, it doesn't and i just want to reiterate i mean the the way the tiff process is structured is i you know the chief executive negotiates the tiff yeah and I try, and we have a process where I try to do that in consultation with the council via the Edlu committee. Right. Um, and I would just submit to you that this is the TIF that okay. I brought forward. Okay. It's enough. based on a considerable amount of discussion, rediscussion, bringing him before the committee. I understand that. And so my preference would be that if you don't like the TIF, then you go back. vote no. And okay. that's. I, I plan to support the TIF. I don't TIF. know if I just ever amended a TIF. Yeah. The council okay. has ever I taken you. to amend an agreement because okay. it's really not the council's job yeah. to negotiate. I hear you. Yeah. So I just want to thank the counselor. I am going to vote to support this, but I, I do appreciate what you were trying to do. And I, I finally understood it after hearing it for the third time. So I do appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other, other questions? Um, from anybody, uh, Councillor Barge. Yes. Um, Councillor Owen from Daniels, I think what I'm hearing from you is that, writing it down, you were looking at a shorter term, correct, which is a shorter period of time. You wanted to make it a larger TIF, correct? And I'm feeling with doing that, it is actually giving us more control. Is that correct? Oh, please, you can respond. My point is simply that it, it provides less risk to the city right. over uh, uh, regarding the re how much revenue is going to this is going to cost, mm -hmm. or and uh, revenue how much revenue is going to cost is a bad way of putting it. But that's my point. And just to, perhaps the mayor will check my <laughs> quick cell phone math here. But right now, this piece of property is generating no taxes. And, and what we're looking at is roughly, uh, on, if this TIF goes through, roughly $40,000 a year in property taxes rather than 60000 for 15 years, at which point this 60 rate will kick in. Um, 30 to 40. Yeah. I didn't hear, what you, I didn't hear the last part. Point of oh, information? Sure. Uh, the current assessed value of 2.8, uh, the tax rate would be f about 40000 a 25% TIF would be 30. 
Oh, I'm just talking about the what it, what it would be versus at 75% with the TIF versus what it would be at full taxation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be 30 versus 40. Yeah. Versus nothing at the moment. Right. Yeah. yeah, the TIF would be nine thousand nine hundred eight, ten thousand yeah. dollars. The twenty-five percent and, and TIF. On the as far as I know, we won't have any kids enrolling in school from this address. And no, <laughs> yeah, so we're not looking at you know eight or nine thousand dollars a resident yeah. in outgoing. Yeah, yeah. no. You know, and my hope is that, is that the, the council sees it. It's a long-term benefit, hopefully. And I know you know Councilman Freeman Daniels does you know can see that as well, and I think he's expressed that as well. Yeah. I'm just hoping the rest of that's okay. it's a long-term commitment hopefully for the 15 years on our end but also hopefully on the city's end as well okay. thank you so um, if there's no more questions in finance and we should probably vote on this one all in favor Aye. of Councilor Tacey yeah. Yeah. once that this is voted on it doesn't change it can't change say that one more time uh, once this is voted on it can't once the signatures are put on this tip and everything it can't change we don't uh, take anything out or put anything in once it leaves the council floor well, you've given me the authorization, you've given me the parameters, and then we'll, we have to sign an agreement that meets all the state guidelines. It then has to be taken to a state economic development committee, which meets quarterly. They have to vote to approve it. He's also, in the background, has worked with, and I should introduce, Terry Masterson is here. He's our city's new economic development director. That's my um, next question. And, and he's been working with Terry because he also has to fill out multiple pages of applications to the state based on this this 15 year 25 percent tiff that'll then get submitted to the state so there's a whole process if we want to make a modification obviously it's an agreement between the two of us we could we could come back and do that or obviously if the terms of it aren't met that would also be um, that would also be grounds for changing the agreement um, like we did with that coca-cola one many many years ago um, so okay I hate to say this, but we'll get one more bite at this apple in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right now in finance, so you'll yeah. get another yeah. bite in a few Tonight. minutes. <laughs> well, oh, uh, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> okay. So, no. um, Councilor Carney. Thank you. I, I just want to bring up a clarifying point, too, because uh, folks have mentioned that, um, that the council in some way has any right to amend the document, the, the contract, really, essentially, that you may or have entered into or are about would like to enter into mm -hmm. given our, our approval with um, the Grantham Group. So, you know, I think that there is some, there's a little bit of confusion as to what the council's role in, is in this. And this, this speaks to some of our, you know, our uh, distribution of powers and, yep. and other items. So um, I'm, I'm glad that you pointed out that what we can do. Well, it's, it's been. Is, the custom, yeah, the procedure that we've developed locally is that I consult with the council via your economic development. I mean, the, what, the reason yeah. I'm bringing this up is that the most similar case, I, I think, that in my recollection is the, edu is the education overlay district, right. in, in which there was a, a, an attempt by the council to um, amend the agreement that then Mayor Higgins had with Smith College. And I think it was emphasized over and over that it was the executive's role to negotiate that with Smith College and we had actually the what we had to was the ability to vote it up or down which is what you presented us tonight um, I mean it, it's clearly you know a, a case where you we you do need to work with the council to get council approval but um, I would just caution us in terms of um, going too much further around down the road of trying to amend at least on this floor Something that we can't amend. And I, well, I guess what I would say is, again, I've, I feel like I have consulted the council very extensively uh, over multiple meetings, meeting with your Edlu committee, and then the other concern I would have about it, doing that is, just from an economic development standpoint, and to pr prospective businesses, et cetera, that you know they spend many months working on this with, in consultation. We bring it forward, and then suddenly it's all changed. And you know he's expressed very clearly what the preference, and so. I, my thought would be if you don't like the agreement that we're bringing forward then just vote against it um, that's the to me that would be preferable and that's kind of what I said to the Ed Loop committee just vote I, vote against it and then that signals to me that that agreements not acceptable and then if we want to try to bring something else forward we can do that um, I just don't then 
it's uh, the negotiation piece on the council floor is, is a little bit difficult. Well, I just brought yeah. that up because exactly. it did um, harken back to the education overlay mm -hmm. district conversation that we had at, on this floor. I've, I've repressed those memories. Yeah, and, and council you know, ultimately yeah, we, we were memories. able to vote that up or down, and I think it did um, pass not quite unanimously, but. Councilor Adams. But this, I mean, just for clarification, this is not like an administrative order which can only be voted up or down. This, I mean, may not be preferable and maybe even um, unwise in certain, for certain reasons, but we certainly can amend this if we chose to. It's not outside of our legislative authority. I, I, what the I, mayor is saying, I believe, is if we're going to start on down that road, it is not a wise road to go down. If he's negotiating economic policy and then he comes in with a council that's going to make amendments to that, and I understand that argument. From a legal standpoint, we certainly could. The mayor is saying, he might say, Forget it. I'm not even going to go forward with this because right. all we're doing. So from a legal standpoint, yes. I think his argument is from a standpoint of what's practical and workable to start amending these similar to the education overlay. Yeah. It's very hard to be in negotiations with someone and make agreements with someone and say, we'll bring those forward when you know whatever I'm saying can get totally changed by somebody else. Councilor Tacey. I'd like to move the question and put it, bring it out to the whole council. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, the, and this is in... This is in finance. So all, all those in finance in favor of moving this forward to council with a positive recommendation say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. Thank you. Then uh, the final piece of this is the CPC piece. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, whereas the City of Northampton and the Granton Group submit an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the Christopher Heights Affordable <coughs> Assisted Living Project, and whereas the project will provide 43 units of affordable assisted living and a new 83-unit assisted living residence at Village Hill, with affordability restrictions to be held by the City of Northampton and the Department of Housing and Community Development, whereas affordable assisted living is a housing type that is in demand locally and regionally and whereas the master plan for redevelopment of the former state hospital includes assisted living and whereas the Granton Group has an excellent record of creating affordable assisted living in Massachusetts, whereas on January 2nd, 2013, the Northampton Community Preve Preservation Committee voted 5 to 1 to recommend that $120,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it be ordered that 120000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the City of Northampton for Christopher Heights Assisted Living Affordable Housing Project for creation of 43 affordable assisted living units and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and City Council and that CPA funds be used to capitalize a portion of the 15-year tax increment financing tax abatement for the project. Specifically, 120000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve account. Um, recommend. Second? Second. Okay, discussion. Did Mayor want to say something? Well, well there's uh, no one, fr uh, I guess there's no one from the CPC here. Um, uh, obviously, I, I myself and Mr. Ohanian went before the CPC and they voted, I believe it was five to one, in favor of the granting of this contingent upon the TIF um, if, if it was tied to the, the TIF being uh, granted. And so um, we discussed it at length and, uh, and I think the, uh, to a person, everyone on the CPC was very impressed in terms of what this was going to be able to provide. Um, the city in terms of affordable housing. And I, I started to go down that road before, um, but I didn't want to jump the gun. But in terms of, again, we've created so far using CPC monies uh, 39 affordable units in five different projects. Uh, the total cost of those projects was $1.145 million, or about $29,358 per unit. This will create 43 units, which is more than we've created to date. Um, at a cost of about $2,800 a unit in CPA dollars. So in terms of, A, creating a really um, needed sector of affordable housing, and B, doing it in a way that's using, you know, stretching CPA dollars very well to leverage other dollars and to leverage state dollars, they were very supportive of it. And there were several housing experts on the panel who were 
getting into a lot of the details about how your structure works and how your financing works and mass health and all the other issues. And again, they were, to a person, very impressed by uh, the project and endorsed it. Um, maybe this speaks, too, to um, an item that will come up in our discussion of council rules. But is there, I don't see that we have any um, document about the CPC's discussion. We don't have their minutes. And um, I guess I would just hope that we had something like that by the next meeting, just to be able to look. And we know, I know it was five to one. I'm just curious as to what the arguments were in opposition. The one argument was the, the one person. Oh, it is? OK. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. It's there? OK, good, OK, good. I'm glad. I, I would just, I you, could clar you could the actually. The application. The application. Yeah. Oh, the application. Mm -hmm. so could you just summarize from your, from there? With uh, there was, and again, I really, I'm, it's not, I'm not necessarily my role I'll to, to summarize, but I can say that the one, the one person um, that voted against was very supportive of the project. He didn't like the linkage with the, C, with the TIF just because he, he felt that the project, similar to what Councilor Freeman Daniels had said and others is that, you know, why don't you just take the CPA money and <laughs> just do the project and forget about the TIF thing. And um, so that was his one hesitation on it. But in terms of the underlying project, he was very, very supportive. I think that was David Rothstein um, was the member who okay. was the one person who voted against it. But. Um, and that was his rationale. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and uh, remind me, you were saying that to date the CPA has subsidized or assisted in subsidizing 36 houses. 39. 39 units. units and this is where, that's the, the total amount they've done to date in the existence of the uh, CPA for Northampton. And now we're going to more than double that. That's in correct. One, one fell swoop. Um, that's, that's. I think that's a, a rather uh, strong endorsement for, for proceeding with this. And, and again, the per unit cost, you know, almost 30000 for the previous, uh, and this is about 2800 um, per unit for these 43. Well, and it is, it is part and parcel why, why the CPA was established. It was part of, it's a, it's a distinct part of the, the mission of the CPA was to provide affordable housing in this, this the fact that we're increasing towards by double is CPA funded. And the other stipulation that's on this is, while if the project goes forward, there will be a, a, a you know, permanent um, affordability restriction by the state, the city will also have an affordability restriction as well. In a, that's sort of an additional insurance for our local Issues. Thank you for that. that, that that's actually and, an important feature. <laughs> yeah, and I would well, say that, that interestingly, um, he mentioned the the project across the street. That actually is a project that was also built with a f uh, low income housing tax credits, and we have an affordable restriction that we hold on that as well. Um, so it's again, there's a lot of great synergies with the overall project and what's happening. Um, Councillor Labar. Yes. Um, I know at our last meeting um, a week ago, Pat Keller had brought it up about this project and the value of housing partnership really being involved in this. And she was very pleased because we need affordable assistant living in this city. And I agree with that. So, that's a great point, and I did I did meet with the housing partnership about the project and about this, and they did and unanimously endorse the project and endorsed it to the CPC. Wrote a letter of endorsement for the project to the CPC. Great. Yeah. So, any further discussion of the CPC component of this? Or are we ready to vote to show? All right. So, all those in favor of sending this to council with a positive recommendation, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Um, the only unanticipated numerical question I have is for Councillor Schwartz. What was the score of the basketball game? <laughs> Can I really tell you? Yeah, yeah, please do. They are in overtime. They were down by two, and Stevie Roach scored two foul shots, and they've tied it, and they're in overtime right now. 
and then oh, you had to leave. Double, and I, I left. I left before the overtime they're in a double happened. Overtime? Oh, you no, know, they're in overtime. overtime. No, no, I don't know. It's the okay. second overtime game this week. I know. In overtime. Is somebody going to text you? I, yeah, I'm getting. Oh, you're I'm you're getting. Over. My husband's texting. Joel's texting. So you're going to let us. Thank know. you for this indulgence. Yes, I'm, like, so, <laughs> I'm so beside myself. Oh. Yes, I'll keep you posted. Okay. So okay. before we before we adjourn finance, do you would you like? These gentlemen to stay when this comes up again. I'm happy to stay, I, but Mr. Ohanian does have to drive to Worcester. No. All right. No. So a motion to adjourn finance? Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move for a recess? Yes. Uh, Five the minutes? Ten minutes? We're back in regular session, and there's been a call for recess, and we'll have a seven minute recess. Thank you. Welcome back. We're uh, coming out of recess. This is going back into the regular meeting of the council meeting. Uh, I do have this to report that Northampton won in overtime by two points. It just <laughs> no for those of you keeping score at home who are watching this instead of the game. And that's your choice. Um, now we come to uh, the reports of the committees. Uh, and entertain a move to take as a group. Second it. Uh, all those in Al, favor? Aye. All in Aye. Aye. Um, and next up is street acceptance petition for Strawberry Hill. Move to refer. Second. A motion to refer to the Board of Public Works and Planning Board. And Planning Board? It's it's. I'm sorry, you're correct. Uh, planning Board and the and the Board of Public Works. Is there a second? Yes, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, also, petition for uh, Park Avenue. Accept them. Refer. Second. Planning board. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed and abstaining? Okay. Now we're up to financial orders. Um, and I'm going to start off by uh, Councilor Adams is kind enough to remind me that under the new charter, as we adopt orders, we are obliged to do roll call votes. No. Ordinance, only ordinance. Uh, and I'm sorry, on ordinance, so that won't be coming on financial orders but for, for just so we're all everyone's up to speed on that one. Mr. President, um, since you just read each of these, could you wave? Would you wave I'm, I'm perfectly or? fine with waving these orders. So if, if um, first up is the financial order, the approval of expenditure in excess of FY2 uh, 2013's. Uh, funds for snow and ice removal. And this is the first reading. I accept a motion. Yes, motion. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Uh, next up is the for the financial purchase of a conservation restriction on West Hampton Road near Parsons Brook. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion on this? I, I do have. I'm sorry. Certainly. No, that's fine. That's why we have this Thank period. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council President. Uh, I just, I'm curious, the city, it's going to be private property. It's going to be inaccessible to the public. Uh, the city will have to maintain the boundaries uh, and to make sure that it's in compliance with the conservation restriction. So there's some, there's some um, <coughs> cu custodial work that's required. I'm just curious, and I'm, it's too bad that um, Director Fiden went home. I'm just curious why the city is paying for this conservation restriction. Sure, please. Since I'm familiar with easements, um, the owner of the property is giving up the right to do many potential uses with it. You know, they have to. They can use it for agricultural purposes or recreational purposes, but they can't put structures on it that don't support agriculture. So they're giving up some property rights, and our our maintenance of it is just to go out and walk the boundaries once a year and make sure they're not trying to drill for oil in the middle of this thing that they said they would only use for conservation or agricultural purposes. So it's not a heavy duty maintenance requirement. I've already spoken. You, did you want to follow up? Can I, the, yeah. can I though? Because I understand that. I, I do get that part mm -hmm. of it. Um, but what I'm, I'm curious about is what the, what this, the public, I mean, it, it's not a large sum of money, it's $10,000, but what, what is the, what does the public see as the upshot to this? If, if the public can't enjoy the property, it's private, it'll be privately owned, privately owned. So if the public can't enjoy the property, oh, the public is just saying it's, it's, it'll be so great to have wildlife that only a few people can see. And I appreciate that it'll be 
by invitation so people can more more than a few people can go but I, I'm just I want to know the public benefit and council spec you want to speak to that the public benefit of, of land and conservation land is not just for public to visit the land there are a lot of other reasons that we have conservation restrictions for water protection for wildlife protection for a lot of other things for quality of air um, so that and the reason we're paying for that is it's not that like it, it's because there's a huge amount for in order to protect land like this for a variety of reasons not just for people to be able to go and walk on the land and so I see a, a, a big benefit by doing this and it raises the whole question about what you're raising is a whole philosophic question do we have um, restrictions like this that we pay for conservation restrictions that the state or a city would pay for is there a value to individuals to have more farmland they're not allowed to go on the farmland but I believe there is because it has a number of values it keeps farming there it's also just to be able to drive by and see property that is not developed it also protects that land so that if there were housing or housing development that went on there in an area where the city is saying we want to not have development our vision for the future is to not have a lot of development out there. It's also protecting the city in that way that we're not going to have more traffic, more cars out in that area. So I think from multiple perspectives, mm -hmm. this is an important thing not only to do now, but I think you raise a good point of why would we philosophically do any of these in the future when the public can't actually use the land as parkland. But I think there are multiple ways to use it that are important. Council LaBarge. Yeah, and I know I had talked about this into finance committee. They're losing a lot of money. There's no question about it. They want to keep it as conservation land. It's absolutely beautiful. And there could be a massive, massive development on that site. We don't want that. We want to keep it as natural as can be. And we have the opportunity, and this is not the first time, as a city councilor, I've seen this happen. And there's a good cause here. I, I, I think to Councilor Daniel's point that um, there, are, there are a lot of devices to protect land from uh, uh, various models of uh, conservation restrictions that aren't just, in, and he's asking about the city's responsibility in, in oversight in granting this conservation restriction, say, as opposed to an APR. Or, or some or a forestry management system or some such and I and, and I think as such it's a legitimate question um, given the limited access um, and I think you all spoke eloquently about the fact that um, the intent of course and this is also in the in the in the long-term planning of Northampton is to preserve open space in the areas in Ward 6 and 7 of course to and also in the context of the conversation about <coughs> watershed um, if you increase non-permeable surfaces with development of course there's an impact but there's an associated cost with that but clearly the, the promotion of trying trying to promote development uh, closer to downtown and services as opposed to trying to discourage further expansion and development in 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 the more rural areas um, and I think Councilor Spector's point that it's a philosophical question is I think that's that's appropriate, I think. It, and and uh, Council Freeman Daniels brought up a question that I actually had myself. So, um, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, this. I mean, I, I really did expect to vote for this, but uh, I just want to point out that in the preamble and, and in and in Director Fiden's description, there was. There was not a lot of mention about watershed protection, impermeable surfaces, so on. I mean, really, we're asking to buy a conservation restriction for private property. Again, not a lot of money. Um, it looked even to me as though it's isolated from the road. So I don't even know if many people are going to see it. So again, I'm just bringing this up. I think it's a legitimate disagreement. I, I really was expecting to vote for it, but I, I do wonder why they don't just give it to the city instead of having the city pay for it. Councilor Carney, then Councilor Spector. Oh, I, I'm just, um, I, I know that referenced is the open space recreation and maintenance plan um, and the recommendations therein and the reference that um, 
uh, Planning Director Fiden made to the half mile or so swath of land that would then have a contiguous um, connection. Exactly. So I think that those were items that were yeah. at the forefront of the Conservation Commission's recommendation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilor Specter, did you want to add to that? Or? I was only, I'm just going to. Praise Councilor Freeman Daniels again, which will pain me. But I think that I do think this, I, yeah, I do think you bring up a good, a good point. I, I, didn't, I just want to make sure that you didn't. Yeah. Uh, okay. A good point. All right. Um, but I do think there's value to this, and I hope you'll see. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Uh, this is. A uh, financial order purchase of 21.4 acres in Broad Brook Greenway, the Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area. It's the first. Reading. So moved. Second. Second it. Any discussion on this one? All those in favor, please. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. And this is a financial order the appropriation of $120,000 from the Community Preservation Act funding. First, the no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I leapfrogged here. Uh, just upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use, um, <coughs> this is. Do you, do you want me to read the order? Please no. Please. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there a motion? So move, move to approve. approve. Yeah. Uh, is there a discussion? Yeah. Don't don't cringe on this. All I want to say is. For folks who tuned in late, I think it's important to note that we're not having much discussion on any of these. They tuned in late and they missed that all of these were just discussed 20 minutes ago or a half hour ago. I just want to make that. sure no one is, yeah, they're watching the game. And right. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. I, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I, um, I proposed a uh, alternate method of financing this TIF uh, in finance and um, the, the, the counselors who made up finance did not find it particularly uh, appealing to, uh, to make the amendment. And, and I see now that, uh, that really my opportunity to, uh, to, to try to get a different TIF passed when, when, Ed, Lieu, uh, when, when Ed Lieu closed its session. Uh, so, I'm, um, so now I have to look at, as I hope most counselors are, at the whole package <laughs> in, and especially in light of Councillor Murphy's uh, uh, distinction regarding the uh, income assessment of property even though I do think the city has risk even if you're wrong uh, or even if you're right rather um, I, uh, I do believe that it's the mayor's job to um, negotiate these TIFs and uh, urged and so I um, on a simple up or down vote I would have to say that I would would approve of this, so uh, I'm I'm going to uh, vote aye. Any other discussion on this? All those in favor? Oh, I'm aye. sorry. You know what? This gonna roll we're going to do a roll call on this. Councilor Adams. Aye. Councilor Kleiner. Aye. Councilor Dwight. Aye. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Aye. Councilor Barge. Yes. Murphy? Yes. Spector? Yes. Schwartz? Yes. Yes. That is approved in first reading and will be back to us at the next council meeting. All right. Here we go. <laughs> this is the financial order. Uh, the, uh, the appropriation of $120,000 from the Community Preservation Act funding to the city of Northampton for Christopher Heights. Assisted Living <coughs> Affordable Housing Project. So moved. Second it. Any discussion on this? Hearing none. Uh, is the preference for a roll call on this yes. as well? Yes. Okay. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. yes. Councilor Freeman Dan? Aye. Councilor Labar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Stafford? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. This is uh, the order is upon the recommendation of City Clerk Wendy Mazza. Order that the special state primary 
<clears throat> will be held on Tuesday the 30th day of April 2013 in the following polling places designated by the Council as follows. Ward 1, Precinct A, Jackson Street School Auditorium. Ward 1, Precinct B, Jackson Street School Auditorium. Ward 2A, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Ward 2B, uh, in Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Uh, Ward 3, Precinct A, in the Senior Center Great Room, 67 Con Street, the same as Precinct B. Uh, Precinct A and B for Ward 4 will be in the Senior Center Great Room, 67 Con Street as well. Ward 5, Precinct A, will be in the Florence Civic and Business Building at 90 Park Street. Ward 5, Precinct B, will be in Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. Ward 6, Ward 6, Precincts A and B will be in the Robert K. Finn Ryan Road School. Ward 7, <clears throat> Precinct A in John F. Kennedy Middle School Community Room. Ward 7, Precinct, Precinct B in Leeds School Gymna Gymnasium Lower Level. The polls will be open at 7 o'clock in the forenoon and closed at 8 o'clock in the evening of the said day. And all such voters in the several wards and precincts in which they are individually entitled to vote between said hours give in their votes for senator in congress to fill a vacancy move to approve second any discussion well this is an order so <laughs> uh call the roll on. i'm sorry order, order. I'm, I'm sorry thank you uh all in favor please aye, aye. aye. all opposed abstaining all right. Um, what I'm going to do is this is this is a special election to be held on Tuesday, the 25th day of June 2013. In the following polling places designated by the council as follows, I will forego reading all of those. Please move to approve. So um, so lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Here we go. This order is, of course, upon the recommendation of the City Council. The attached City Council yeah. rules be and hereby are adopted for the 2012 to 2013 City Council. So, um, it's <laughs> I, 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 sure, no, Woods. No, I, I, um, you voted on those orders so quickly, I, didn't realize you had already voted on the deficit spending for snow and ice, and I wasn't clear. Yeah, no, no, you're covered on that one. Oh, no, we gonna re oh, you want, oh, you were going to ask two readings. I was going to ask for it since we're most likely, after this weekend, going to need to be deficit spending. So we'll to suspend. Well, I, but I, but let, I, I, didn't, I just was, that's why I was asking the council clerk about that. So. Um, okay, well, we haven't had a motion on this, so um, this will move us out of order. Rule, there's a so motion to suspend Rule 14 for a second reading second. upon. Okay. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Move second reading. Uh, uh, financial order one. A, fi mm -hmm. a financial order one. So Thank nice. you for making that. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good catch. Um, and once again, we're back on this upon the recommendation of the City Council. The attached City Council rules will be and hereby are adopted for the 2012-2013 City Council. I'll accept a motion on this. So moved. Second. And now time for the discussion. We would like to, uh, and actually I'm going to defer to Councilor Adams. He is he's, uh, devoted a lot of time and energy and advocacy for this and as uh, my enduring gratitude for the work that he's done on this. So take it away. And thank you for no PowerPoint, too. But <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm just going to read the conclusion to my third executive summary. I hope Councilor has got a chance to read um, this final executive summary. These proposals have come from much robust discussion and genuine deliberation. I want to thank my fellow counselors for all the input and careful thought that they have given to this set of proposed changes. Please keep in mind that when the new charter passed, we were given a mandate by the solicitor to amend the council rules so that they will be consistent with the new charter. I took this as an opportunity to do <coughs> more than just that. 
I took this as an opportunity to redraft the rules so that the council business can be conducted with more efficiency. Further, I use this as an opportunity to make the rules more consistent with council customs. I have tried to be as forward thinking as possible with not only this session in mind, but also considering future council sessions. Fortunately, our new system of council governance is working effect effectively, but I still think we need to think as prospectively as possible. The final set of rules that will be voted on may not be every councilor's ideal set of rules. Rules that matter to individual councilors may have been amended somewhat, amended substantially, deleted completely, or never incorporated pursuant to a failed amendment. On the other hand, rules may be in the final version that some councilors disagree with. Please bear in mind that this set of rules has many proposed changes, some substantial, some minor, but the final product is a compromise and, at a minimum, will allow us to meet our mandate of having, having a set of rules that are consistent with the new charter. Given that, I ask all of the councilors for their affirmative vote on this order. Thank you. And um, I, I don't mind ceding the floor to other councilors. At some point, I would like to propose a few friendly amendments that were explained in the, in the um, executive summary, and I can go over those at another point. Have all the councilors had an opportunity to read the rules and propose yes. and, the, and the executive summary? Uh, yep. Councilor Spector? I just want to quickly thank Councilor Adams. And you even called me on a Saturday. Was it Saturday night? I don't know what time, still working on this thing. So thank you for doing it. <laughs> um, I, I think for the public at large, what should be noted is these are the rules that it will govern the way we conduct business and policy here. And it is, we establish the rules. This is not a charter item. This is not, this is not, this is where we basically as we struggle to find the most efficient, most open, best practices way of proceeding as, as, a, as a council group. And um, these are our guidelines by which we, we will conduct polity. And we hope it actually will work for more efficiency and also better and clearer government. I think I, and I think it goes a long way towards that. Uh, Councilor LaBarge. Yes, um, I also want to thank Councilor um, Adams for all the time that you have spent on these um, council rules. I've attended to the best that I could on ordinance committee and listening very carefully. I do have to say, if I had a question to ask, I would email you. You would give me your thoughts back on it. And I just want to say thank you for the hard work. Does the chair of ordinance want to talk about this? In this yeah, I do, I do yeah. actually. And, and, uh, this was perceived as a real arduous task, I think, when we started on it, um, and it was sent to ordinance. And I want to thank the other councilors who came to ordinance committee meetings on various occasions <laughs> and contributed to the process of working through these. In the end, I don't think it was as arduous a task as we perceived it could have been because everybody worked really well together. And again, I want to join the thanks to Councilor Adams for the role he played um, to work on these um, and and take the various drafts and put them together in a, in a comprehensive form that we can vote on tonight. So uh, thank everybody uh, on behalf of ordinance for the work they put into this and especially Councilor Adam. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels then. Thank you. Uh, I also I actually want to thank ordinance for putting up with me for at least two meetings. Um, and uh, I will apologize to ordinance because uh, you heard this argument um, last week. Uh, but uh, I'd like to make a move an amendment to the rules 6.8. Um, I'd like to actually strike that uh, s rule 6.8. <coughs> That's my motion. Strike. <coughs> the motion's been made and second. Any discussion? Yes. Can Just, I can I you read speak in favor of? Uh, I'm sorry. The, yeah, no. Could you read the 6.8 for the benefit of? Yeah. The one? Well, it's 6.8 is the council president may state facts, ask questions, and give opinions during the debate without relinqu relinquishing the chair. And uh, Council Freeman Daniels, the other floor. Thank you. Um, to this is the the chair neutrality rule, uh, which is um, uh, the the common way of doing business in uh, Robert's rules, which is actually also incorporated into these rules, is that the chair may leave the chair, relinquish the chair uh, in order to give opinions, to enter into debate. And uh, I think the, um, 
the, the most important part of that is the distinction between running a meeting and uh, and uh, offering opinion and, and trying to influence uh, your fellow counselors in their in in their uh, in their deliberations. Um, the ordinance committee looked at various ways of of uh, of um, fixing this, uh, it possibly because we knew we now have a, le a legislator who acts as the president, and uh, it, it could be considered that uh, a, a president would be silenced, um, but for a procedural um, procedural. Uh, um, motion of, of relinquishing the chair, the president would mostly be uh, unable to opine without leaving the chair. And so uh, there you'd have one legislator that's silenced. Um, I think that, uh, I think that f for the sake of the um, integrity of debate, that the president, um, the person who has, or who maintains order over meeting should not be able to enter into debate and should have to relinquish the chair. I. Uh, I first brought this up to Councillor Dwight, who um, did some homework and, uh, and found um, some of our nearest neighbors, Greenfield, Holyoke, and East Hampton, and uh, sent us the, uh, the council rules from those. And I, I really appreciated actually reading those, um, coming to see how different communities do, the, do things differently. And uh, I then Realize that while well, Greenfield is is similar to Northampton in, in geography, it's not the same as far as population goes. Uh, Springfield obviously much bigger, uh, Holyoke closer, but not the same. Same with East Hampton. So I uh, I did the work of um, collecting the council rules from 16 cities in Massachusetts that are close to Northampton, either in size or geography. And I also collected Worcester, which is a uh, close in geography, I suppose, but it's it not really the same uh, because the, the council chair is uh, the mayor, um, so it's a little different. Uh, but uh, of, the, of the other 16, only one, one out of 16 had in their council rules language that allowed the president, uh, the chair that is, to, uh, to give opinion without having to relinquish it. All the other communities, uh, required the chair to leave the, the seat uh, in order to state opinion. And I think it, I, would, I would wager that most of them are just carrying over from older rules, which were probably modeled after Robert's rules. But I think that there's some wisdom to most of those in that they're trying to preserve the, um, the integrity of debate by limiting uh, what, a, what the chair does, the, the chair presides over debate, the chair rules on matters of order, and thus being able to rule on matters of order and also to enter into debate, I think, is, is um, damaging to, to the debate, to actual genuine deliberation. Uh, that's compounded by a cross-reference that I did on whether the, when the president rules on matters of order, whether those opinion, whether that ruling can be appealed. Uh, and um, most, uh, most, um, cities, again, uh, actually a couple fewer this time, um, allow for appeal of the, of the chair's ruling. So in other words, uh, if, if the chair says to a, a counselor, oh, you're out of order, the counselor can, for whatever reason, the counselor can say, I, I'm not, I, an appeal to the council at large, and, uh, have, and, and the council can vote to either overrule the chair or not. Um, well, that's, that's not possible here in Northampton. Uh, the, the, the chair's ruling is final. There's no appeal. Uh, and uh, the only two communities that did that in Massachusetts that are anywhere close to Northampton, either in size or geography, did it by charter. The rest of them have in their rules uh, an allowance for an appeal. I believe that the combination of absolute authority when it comes to ruling on matters of order and being able to, op to opine from the chair is a power that's, that's the, the, com the combination is, uh, could really hurt the integrity of debate. <coughs> and that is why I'm asking the council to strike 6.8.
consultation and council meeting. Point of order. Has there been a second on the? Um, no. Uh, was that? I that's your, uh, He's offering that. Yeah, I, I, Councilor Adams did second. Okay, thank you. So consultation <laughs> and. So, the, the chair would relinquish. The gavel. So, would have to go to someone who has not already opined or does not and, and whoever would take the gavel would have to be agreeable not to opine is that correct for that issue yeah. uh, and you, I, believe, you're welcome to answer. I believe that uh, we would have I think rule 8 allows the chair to leave the, the presiding officer to leave the chair and, and uh, if it's the president I think they give it to the vice president is that correct right uh, and then if the vice president has if the vice president doesn't want it, it would pass to uh, a qualified city councilor. So we, we do have language. Oh, no, I, I know, I read it. So you're still going to have, there's going to be somebody that's not going to be able to opine. So somebody would have to be agreeable not to opine to take the hammer. Uh -huh. uh, councilor Adams, to, to that point? or Yes, for that issue. For that issue. Yeah. And then you cannot take the gavel back until that issue has been disposed of. Correct. That's correct. In its entirety. Correct. Councillor Murphy, then Councillor Spector. Um, you want to delete all of 6.8. Do you have any objections to the council president stating facts and asking questions? So it's really just giving opinions. So we could leave it in and just remove give opinions so the president that's, that's could friendly. state facts and ask questions during debate, just not render opinions. My point is not to silence the council president. Yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest concern. That's fine. That's f that's friendly. Um, okay. So the, there's a friendly amendment and it's agreed. Council Specter, you had. Yeah, just a question. Can the gavel keep passing then? Because I was just thinking on a very important it issue, could. the kind of issue that most of us want to give input on, mm -hmm. including a council president. Council president decides, well, I want to speak, so it passes the gavel. Then the next person would, in order, they can't opine, but they could pass it to somebody can they pass it to somebody who has already opined? No. And the answer no, is no. they can't. And so therefore we hit this place of it's usually on the issues that are really important that we all want to weigh in on. On a, most issues, it's fine because someone else is giving that opinion. But it's on those issues that, are, that come up every once in a while that we all want to have some input on. And I think at that point, if it might be we're looking at that, it's like, well, would any of us then want to be council president? Um, I'm not sure. It would certainly it be something to think about. Yeah, right, but, uh, I, I, I agree. That is something to think about. I, I think that um, two things. One, I think that um, when you're the council president, you get, you get to rule on matters of order. Absolutely. So there are some pluses and it's there's true. a minus. And the second part, it, to the second answer to that is that uh, if the council at the council's wish, we can suspend a rule, uh, and we could suspend uh, Robert's Thank rules, you. of course, and and the chair could opine then from from their position so, after suspending Robert's rules. Um, so, so, just so and, I understand, relate. Yes, what you're saying is, in the course of the debate, if everyone, if everyone's gone around, yeah, yeah, we've gone around that we could actually, at that moment, say we will right now change that rule right, well, you, and allow the council president. You, does it say you, that was in that? You'd suspend Rule 8 and Robert's, thank you. And Robert's okay. rules. Okay, thank and, you. And, and, but I would imagine that the circumstances would be, would be rare. I but agree. I just want to make sure that it, there was room. Okay. Um, in, if, you, if you'll indulge me, actually, I'd like to point out that <laughs> we, I've been abiding by this since actually uh, assuming this chair, and uh, with, with the exception of speaking, in finance and opining in finance, uh, which which actually makes for a strange circumstance because then everyone knows what my opinion is in, in, in finance. But the uh, and the question that I had raised and and uh, it's merely a question; it's not an opinion, actually, to be honest. It's is the fact that a councilor at large represents the city at large consequently there's also an, there's another councilor at large you we speak to larger issues and broader points and represent bro a broader constituency the concern is what happens if a ward councilor is made 
uh, the council president, in which case they are they are very limited in advocating for the issues in their ward. That's that's a concern. Uh, Councilor Kern, and then Councilor Adams. Okay, with all due respect, President, Mr. President, um, we did hear opinions tonight on the matter of the conservation restriction, and you opined very eloquently on the um, merit of Councilor Freeman Daniels' uh, argument. Couldn't help himself. That was in finance, though. So. No, no, it was in the regular meeting because yes, it was, the regular meeting. Uh, yes, oh. yes, so planning was. director Fiden had uh -oh. had left, and we had a lot of that. Rules weren't and, nor do I, think, nor do I think that that's inappropriate. I do think that it's uh, you know I, I'm I understand the arguments that Councilor Freeman Daniels makes, and they are compelling. But I, I mean, I think that we can make a compelling argument, make a, an equation between the right of appeal to matters of uh, to ruling and weigh that against opining. That's one way to do it. Um, I think it's something that uh, the counselor has really crafted as being very, very persuasive. I'm not persuaded that we need that here with, with this body. Um, I'm not convinced that there is a danger that we have, especially um, since I, I have not seen it. I have not seen it really in any of, you know, the times I've been on the city council, maybe I would defer to some of the more senior members. Um, but I do think that uh, the council president brings up a good point. Should a ward councilor be the council president and presiding as chair, it might put them in a very difficult position not to, not to opine. And I'm also really uncomfortable with the passing of the, of the gavel. Um, I do think that it was not while we had some discussion at ordinance about the uh, right to appeal and that being a matter of uh, on ruling and um, that be being set in the charter, um, I don't think it was the intent of the charter drafters to take the uh, right to opinion away from the council president or the chair. And that hasn't been our practice. If we are being consistent with Councillor Adams' um, intent here with our council rules to kind of make them more consistent with what our practice is, you know, I, I, I'm more comfortable with leaving the language of 6.8 as it has been uh, drafted and submitted by Councillor Adams. And um, I, I really appreciate um, Councillor Freeman Daniels' long and intensive work. We had some discussion about this, about the 16 cities and towns. Um, but I'm not, I'm not persuaded that it's something that we really need to do in terms of taking the right to opinion away from the council president. Councilor Adams and Councilor Schwartz. <coughs> I agree that this body doesn't need this rule because I don't think that the potential danger has, I don't, I don't believe we've experienced that. And I also don't believe that we will experience that. But in, in drafting these rules, and I know as it states, it, it allows for opining, but I do think we should be as prospective as possible. If a situation arose where the potential da danger that Councillor Freeman Daniels is describing happened, I think it could be quite detrimental. And I also think that at that point we would have to do some rule cha rules changes to, mm -hmm. to address it, and that's reactive. And I just think right now we can be proactive and avoid that. So um, I do think that future candidates for council president should, if this rule passed, future candidates should consider if they want to be more of uh, if they want to be the administrator of the council rules and the facilitator, or if they want to um, be more of a, of a vocal advocate, um, because of course, even if they choose to be a, a facilitator, they can always pass the gavel in certain instances. And further to, to um, Councilor Spector's good point, if Councilor Freeman Daniels amendment passed, I'd be happy to create a rule that's similar to the rule of necessity. The rule of necessity has to do with conflicts, but I could create a rule easily by drafting a rule where if everyone wishes, wishes to opine, then it would make sense that the president would have to, uh, would not have to relinquish the chair. But um, I, I don't, I don't think it's, I, I, even if the, the, the amendment fails, um, I'm, I'm certainly obviously in support of, of the rest of the document. So I hope it passes, even if the amendment fails. But I do, I do support the amendment. Thank you, Council Schwartz and Council Labarge. Uh, I think I'll just add that I appreciate your thinking and your vigilance. And I think, in an absolute sense, you're correct. And in an as applied sense, I don't like it. 
So I, I want, I just want to hear from my council president. I just want that option as a counselor. So I'm admittedly on the ground going with my experience of being here and in this environment, and I don't want that restriction. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Um, I want to thank you, Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels, for the amendment that you brought forth. I really don't want this type of restriction placed on a council president. I'm not, I'm not happy about it. I am really uncomfortable about it. It's like, to me, you have a council president <laughs> that has been nominated by us counselors. And I feel, as a counselor, that he should be able to speak or we speak to him. I'm just uncomfortable with the way that amendment came in. And I don't feel that there's any type of danger. I've never even seen it, even when we had the mayor representing us here at City Council. Never saw any form of a danger. But I feel that I want to hear from our council president also. I, I just feel there's a lot of value there. And it's like, I'm just feeling like we want to shut him off or her on the ability to be able to speak and so forth. I'm, I'm not happy with that. I'm begging the council's indulgence in that this may be my last opportunity to opine. Okay. <laughs> Please. I'm actually going to vote in favor of the amendment. I actually take uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels point to heart and 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 Councilor Adams as he points out I mean we're not voting whether Bill Dwight can speak we're voting whether a council president is going to be presiding we don't know who that's going to be we don't it might not and it won't be we're setting a s <coughs> rules that can change and the council can change them but that's this is harder if it's if if it's a if it's a a permission that's granted, it's harder to pull out in the context of a, a a very difficult and controversial period. If if you do have an autocratic council president who decides to rule things out of order at the same time, be able to hold forth and then control the whole force of the debate, and there's no mechanism, there's not a lot of mechanisms to counter that. It it. I think you could create a dysfunction within the council that we we don't anticipate now. We don't, certainly with our colleagues now we don't see something like that. But the fact that something like that could exist um, is worth considering. I think, given the constraints as they're laid out, with the opportunity of a, of a council that, that particularly this council, for instance, that would uh, um, would entertain a suspension of the rules should it if, if if I or whatever future council president would make an appeal to ask for the opportunity to express an opinion, and they do suspend rules, we suspend rules all the time. And if that were to, if that mechanism were in place, then I think that's a comfortable situation. I've been working this way with <laughs> with the one slip today, apparently, but the the um, uh, quite comfortably. And, and as I said, the only point that I brought up was my concern is if, if a ward counselor, I do, that's one big concern that still hasn't been reconciled with me, but I think to the larger point, the larger ethical and cleaner point is I actually agree with the, the, the force of the amendment. Councilor Specter and then Councilor Carter. Although I'm not sure how I'm going to vote on this yet, but I think to the point of if a ward councilor were president, those issues that it seems an easier problem because those issues that the ward councilor was dealing with, for the most part, would be such that they could step down and give the gavel to, to someone else. Um, through the chair to the councilor. Do we expect then that this... Um, rule would apply then to, to committees of the council as well. So would in each of the subcommittees, the chair, um, likewise, not opine? Because I think right now most of our council rules are, are applied. Yeah. This is the amendment. I'm, I'm asking, I'm asking so about the, amend, uh, the amendment. So the question is directed to Councilor Freeman Daniels, but Councilor Adams, if, if you wish to defer to him. I, I, you say you want to say something? Well, I, I mean, I, I think the general rule is that the specific committees can 
um, create their own rules. And, and for example, in the public comment rule in this that I propose, I expressly drafted that this all the other committees should be bound to that rule. But I don't think that this, I don't think that this binds all the all the committee rules. And I wouldn't want to do that either because, and I can create express language to not to, to not do that because I know that some of the committees tend to be informal, very informal, and I wouldn't want to um, create that burden on all the committees. Um, just to to expand on that, it seems to me that. You know, the same reasoning would apply to subcommittees. And even if they're only, you know, a three or four body subcommittee. And I'm assuming then that the counselor would expect that this rule would apply then because those, those chairs of those subcommittees also would be able to rule on matters of order, which, I, I, I mean, even though they can uh, create their own rules, it would seem that a, a subcommittee that would create rules that would be counter to the council's rules would I don't know. I don't. I don't see that there there would be much reason in that. Again, I'm I'm not compelled by the equation of the right the ruling on matters of order and whether those can be appealed or not, and the ability to give opinion. I understand that you've taken those and and placed them one above the other, and created you know come up with a situation where you have one one <coughs> community. However. I do think that it's not the first time, um, I, I wouldn't be able to say, but it's not the first time that the uh, chair has expressed opinion. And the previous chairs, uh, be they mayors or whoever they may be, have regularly, <coughs> by past practice, um, expressed opinion at this body. And I just think that we're creating this layer that will make it much more difficult for us. We'll be having to suspend rules and pass the gavel and. I just don't think that it's necessary. I'm not compelled by the argument that it's necessary. I don't see the danger, and I don't see the past um, experience of there being a situation. And I think if there were to be, that would be the time for us then to create, craft a rule or something to deal with a situation that may seem untenable. I don't know that we need to prevent some despot of a, of a, of a council chair from being in uh, that position. And that seems to be what we're doing here is we're looking to see that we're preventing a kind of, you know, um, despotic chair. Can I just respond to the, to the point about the subcommittees being a slippery slope? Uh, the, the charter states that the council president has matters in, in the full city council rules on matters of order without subject to appeal. So it, it does not state, the charter does not state that the subcommittees have their chairs ruling on matters of order uh, without subject to appeal. So um, th there, there wouldn't be the same situation uh, with subcommittees. The subcommittees could have uh, co-chairs. The subcommittees could have a chair who follows this to the T, but uh, their rulings of order would be could be subject to appeal. The only the, what's limiting in this circumstance in Northampton is that Northampton, like Gloucester, are the only two communities where, by charter, the council president has makes rulings that are subject to appeal. So um, the subcommittees are, are are a separate issue and not related. Um, the other piece is that uh, I I I only served under um, Mayor Higgins for, you know, two meetings or something. Uh, and, but um, you wouldn't have ever seen the combination of two powers uh, of an opining chair, which at the time was not uh, according to the council rules. That was a breaking rules, basically, if, if, the, if the mayor uh, opined while sitting in the chair. <coughs> and uh, unimpeachable uh, rulings because uh, it wasn't, the, it, it wasn't the city's uh, constitution to have rulings be unappealable. Uh, rulings could be appealed. So if, if the chair ruled someone out of order, they could appeal. And uh, so that was, uh, you, you wouldn't have ever witnessed the combination of being able to opine uh, and, uh, and being able to rule. And my point of compiling the other 16 cities of Massachusetts that are close to Northampton in geography or population was not just to show a lot of blue and a little bit of yellow. 
and to show and to show that the vast majority of of uh, of uh, cities live with this division of powers. It was to show that, in fact, no city, uh, no city, in in Massachusetts, near Northampton in geography or population, has attempted to combine these two powers. So you you wouldn't witness the combination because no city has attempted it. Our trying to do this, uh, I, I don't think that passing the gavel is a, 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 a vast a, a hurdle. Uh, and what I like about passing the gavel is that it, it gives a clear signal that, that, that the person is entering into debate rather than uh, managing the council. And that's what is so, um, that's what's so conspicuous about it, and that's what I like about it. And I, I, um, I do like hearing from the council president, I agree, but uh, I, I think that the, when the council president speaks, it should be uh, under the rule of someone else and not under their own rule. So, council, you were saying we are very unique. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very. Very unique. Yeah. The unique east. Uh, Councilor Tacey. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, Part of the biggest reason for the, well, the charter for me was to take the mayor. And we separated the mayor from the legislative body. That was what it was all about. In the mayor's defense, uh, Mayor Narkowitz, from the time he took office and sat there, he obeyed the rules. He never interrupted. He did not opine. He sat right there and he ran the meeting. He was strictly at the meeting a parliamentarian. He did answer questions of fact if we had to ask him a question, period. The previous mayor was like the rules didn't exist. It was, I, we, I won't get into it, but th that's what this was all about. And I want to hear him. I want to hear what he's got to say. There's nine people here. I want to ruin the whole, me the whole mix that we have worked on here to try and put this together. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to be a parliamentarian. I want to hear what he's got to say. I do expect us to have some order. But I still, I, I'd still like to hear what he's got to say. I might not always agree with him, but I want to hear what he's got to say. I don't want to take him out of the mix. There's nine people here. We have two at-large councils. We put this system together, and I didn't. I mean, it's been together for years and years and years. And I don't. Uh, I just as soon leave it just like it is. And I, and I, I, that's the way I would vote. So the discussions on the amendment. Are, are there any other? Any further discussion on the amendment to uh, which now is just striking uh, gives opinions? Right. And I'd like to, like to call the question. Six eight. Would you, like to, you, would you like to give an opinion on calling the question? I want to make sure we know just exactly what this is. I know. The, this is on the amendment. I'll read with the amendment the council president may state facts, ask questions during the debate without relinquishing the chair. Is that correct? So, and uh, uh, there's been a call for the question's been called and a roll call has been requested. Call the roll, please. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You have you have a question. I couldn't hear that. We're are we voting on his amendment? amendment? Yes, just on the amendment. And, yeah. Thank you. And we're going to do it as a roll call, and I'm the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. No. Councilor Murphy? No. Councilor Spector? No. Councilor Schwartz? No. Councilor Tacey? No. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? No. Amendment fails. And Councilor Adams? I'd like to propose a friendly amendment to changing uh, the words the council president to the presiding officer because yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yes well I will explain further um, in, I second I second that in okay. that number eight yeah yeah so the the amendment presiding proposal officer. on on six eight there, are there other places as well the presiding officer actually that we probably should have that in the language um, I thought for the most part. <laughs> Okay, so just you just in case, okay. just in case, can we Co say, can we say a blanket anywhere that it says uh, and all that we should change it to presiding officer? Uh, well, th not every case, no, no, not okay. because we talked about the election of the council. Oh, yeah, and it probably okay. should be specific to that. Oh. 
Well, in this, in this case, uh, the amendment proposed oh, is second. okay and is second. Second, it is changing in 6 8 the council president to presiding officer, and it would now read the presiding officer may state facts, ask questions, and opinions during the debate without relinquishing the chair. And there was a second in this All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Councilor Adams. If I could propose another friendly amendment, I made a reference to this one too in the uh, executive summary. Um, it's, it has to do with Rule 35. Um, it's <coughs> slightly confusing, but when, when, you, when you go through and really think about it, 35, we changed that rule so that um, what we typically have referred to as late files because they came in after Friday. And, um, a lot of those actually weren't late files because the really is. It's really Tuesday at 7 because our meetings are at Thursday at 7. But um, just so that there can actually be some time to incorporate um, what's submitted, we've, it was suggested at council, at the ordinance committee, that the, it, the deadline should be noon. And, um, and what I'd like to do is I propose striking the second sentence. Of that, um, and the reason why is because, as, as I explained in the the executive uh, summary, is that essentially um, this would create a situation where you'd have to, if there was a, if, if something came in after noon, you would have to suspend this rule, and then you would have to suspend if it were to be heard on Thursday, you would have to suspend the new business rule as well. And the way around that is to strike the second sentence of this um, no measure filed after Tuesday at noon prior to the date of the council meeting shall be considered unless the measure could not be reasonably anticipated prior to the filing deadline so based on that I would request um, and I'll make the motion second thank you strike the whole sentence second sentence yep. and point of clarification oh. <laughs> um, and this was being um, changed in its title as well to be unanticipated measures after the striking of the rule I was going to request that we just cha change it to the old title which is timely filing that would be that was gonna timely be, filing that was gonna be my third mm -hmm. friendly okay. um, amendment so yeah. so if, um, so striking that language striking the second sentence of the 35 would, would result in the in in eliminating the confusion of having to strike two rules and I will read what what remains is the unanticipated measures rule all orders ordinances resolves contracts and written business to be transacted by the City Council shall be filed with the clerk of the council on or before noon Tuesday prior to the date of the council meeting yeah. no. um, we have timely filing and unto unanticipated measures I think he wants to substitute or are we getting rid of this right. title and just putting <clears throat> That's my next. He's, he's got another proposed amendment. That's my next. A, friend, a friendly amendment. Why don't you make that as part of it? I could, yeah, sure. You combine. Them. If I can just yeah. include that as one friendly. Yeah. Strike second line and replace the. Me that's the new motion. The title. Second. Council entertain yeah. that. Thank you. Aye. And would you read? So would you read it as, as timely it stands filing. now for the court? Thirty-five timely filing rule. All orders, ordinances, resolves, contracts, and written business to be transacted by the council, shall be filed with the clerk of the council. On or before noon Tuesday prior to the date of the council meeting. So, Councilor, yes. Councilor Adams, on that first sentence, are we taking out city? Because I didn't hear you say city, we're just leaving council. Um, here, no, lost you. I'll be with you in a second. No, I think. But on that first sentence, because you just said council. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I skipped the city's supposed to be in there. Thank yeah. you. Right. So he's changed, he's proposing to change the name of the rule and then mm -hmm. deleting the second. So it's now instead of unanticipated uh, measures rule, it's untimely. Thank you. Timely, timely, timely filing. Timely filing. Yeah. Timely, mm -hmm. I don't want to, what am I projecting? I'm timely filing. <laughs> yes. A friendly? Timely filing. Yeah. Timely filing. Councilor Adams. I have another friendly amendment. Um, on this order? 
Yes. Vim, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Yeah, not Vim vote Lens. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the proposed changes? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And Council Rappers. Rule 8 is the rule about the presiding officer having the right to leave chair to advocate for a position. Right. That's now irrelevant because that's there's no need based on our last vote a couple ago. So uh, I. May, um, would that. If the chair would need to, for other reasons, such as a conflict of interest or a needing to uh, recuse oneself, wouldn't that make sense then for this rule to mean? To well, it remain? could, but this rule is specifically about to ad ad it's specifically for advocating for a position. Are you proposing an amendment? Yes. Okay. No. Well, pro well, proposing an amendment, <laughs> striking <laughs> the, rule. the whole rule. Yes, it's and calling for a deletion. Yeah. Deletion. Which would reorder the numbers. I'll second for purposes. Which would reorder the numbers. Okay. So again, uh, um, are we seeing seeing no reason at all for this for this? Uh, um, well, it says to advocate a position on a measure. So are we saying it's redundant if the if the if it's, the presiding officer is already assumed to. Um, Give up the chair. Give up if there is if if the presiding officer has to recuse um, him herself. Well, this would have only made sense if the neutrality rule passed. So, it, being that it didn't, okay. this rule is solely about advocating for a position. If there are other reasons, uh, the, the presiding officer may wish to pass the gavel based on conflict or something else. That's just mm -hmm. outside the scope. Is this, of this just rule. an oversight that this was left in? Well, I, well, I didn't know if, if the neutrality rule passed, we would have needed this rule. Oh, this was just in case the amendment that was just offered passed? Right, because this is from the old language. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. Councilor Freeman Dan. Thank you. Uh, I actually uh, um, I disagree with, uh, with striking this because I think that, uh, because obviously I support the neutrality rule, I, I think it's valuable if the council president wants to mm -hmm. leave the chair to signal that, that he's, uh, he or she is, is, is giving an opinion that, they, that he can, he or she can. But of course, Robert's if this rule weren't there, Robert's rules would control. But Robert's rules, I think the um, mechanism is a little different. So I would suggest just leaving this in, just in case. I'll withdraw the motion in case it happens at the chair. Draw my second. Mm -hmm. And you could also just remove the language about advocating a position. And just leave it at the council the president wants to leave the chair for any reason. Right. Yes. Well, yes. Whatever. Right. Thank you. you know, I'll, yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll make the the, the just motion. Just take out that. <laughs> My friendly, my friendly amendment will be have the right to leave chair. Period. Um, period. 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 Second. <laughs> so the, the, the now the amendment is no longer to delete. It is to amend the language by deleting um, the language uh, for the purpose of expressing to advocate or to express an opinion. Yeah. We are eliminating to advocate a position on yep. the measure. Councilor Pim again. You're, you're, at, you're de deleting everything after chair of the first sentence. Yeah. Right. But leaving the other sentences false. Right. right. Yes. Just the first sentence. Yeah. yeah. And Councilor Tacey, do you have something? Okay. Uh, Councilor Adams? Could you just read that over again? The uh, yeah. Councilor Adams, would you read uh, the amended language of yeah. the of Article 8. 8. Presiding officer's right to leave chair. After any meeting is organized, the presiding officer shall have the right to leave the chair. The chair shall appoint the vice council president or in the absence of the council vice president, a qualified city councilor to perform the duties thereof, but only for the discussion of the measure for that day or during, or, or during that meeting. A qualified city council shall be one that has not yet stated a position on the measure before the council. Strike. Uh, uh, amend, <laughs> it's further amended. Yeah. Yes. It it's further amended. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, get rid of after, qualified even. Right. Or, or just qualification. Uh, from after the words council vice, after this second time council vice president appears, just period and delete everything after? Yes. That all everything after that assumed that there's the, there was assumed a necessity of neutrality it just doesn't make sense now. The, um, the language that we already have in terms of succession, right? No. So, so I can read it. Should I read it again? Sure. It's amended. Yeah. Eight. Presiding officer's right to leave chair. After any meeting is organized, the presiding officer shall have the right to leave the chair. 
the chair shall appoint the council vice president or in the absent or period well appoint the council vice president period um council Darn. yeah um if the council vice president is unable or unwilling then we have language succession language further on can there be a reference to that rule sure i can i do you mean and succession as consistent with rule whatever number that is right and that's in, that's in the the um council president election rules because that was the that's, that was where yeah. we determined. okay so just a reference to that rule so sure, just I, in case okay. okay sure um now we're making it, sausage <laughs> Councilor Freeman, Daniel, you are a little concerned. Yeah, we just leave the rule, and we, you can work on it and bring it back to the council, or bring it to bring second it to reading. And, and second, bring it at second yeah. reading. Yeah, I would agree like on a lot of these. That trying to work wordsmith this in the whole group it, is going to take a lot of time, and I I trust if if you're up yeah, second, I think second this. reading is perfect. Except yeah. for a second. Reading. Sure. Okay. That is, of course, presuming a second reading. It's presuming a second reading. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't come, um, to do it at all. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Councilor Adams. So, it, it, if there is any language amended, um, I'll, I'll just I'll just propose the, the rule entirely next time. We can just want you to make so, it yourself. So, th okay. So, there is there is no pending amendment to vote on. Now. <laughs> yes. Uh, Councilor I'll withdraw my second. I'd, I'd like to uh, make an. I'd like to offer an amendment to Rule Thirty One. Rule Thirty One. Uh, I submitted uh, a two-paragraph uh, rewrite earlier in the week, and uh, so it would be striking the entirety of Rule Thirty One as it's as proposed and adding and uh, submitting uh, submitting this instead. The Rule 31 is referenced to committees as it stands now, as, as it's <coughs> listed here, is when any matter, matter is referred to a commission board authority or committee of any agency of the City of Northampton to a committee of the City Council, the clerk of the council shall notify the chair of said commission board authority or committee of any or any agency of the City of Northampton or committee of the City Council of such reference and furnish thereto a copy of the original of all votes or papers pertaining to the subject matter, any committee board authority or commission shall report to the council approval, uh, disapproval, or return without recommendations, all in accordance with the city charter. That is being, uh, the council Freeman Daniels is asking to strike that completely and replace with the language here. And actually, <laughs> you be so kind as to read the, the language of your own end. Sure. When any matter is referred to a multiple member body or to a committee of the city council, hereafter just committee, the clerk of the council shall notify the chair said committee of such reference. The clerk of the council shall make available to the chair or staff of the committee any public meeting notes, whether in the form or finalized where the matter was discussed, and all other documents addressed to the council through the office of the clerk of the council or to the council president that was intended to the full council pertaining to the subject matter referred up until the date the matter was referred. To satisfy this requirement, non-electronic submissions may be kept in a designated publicly accessible place within a city municipal building, and electronic submissions can be delivered to the committee by email or by using a dedicated web page. And then this is, this is the, the reference part. Any committee's chair or staff shall report to the council approval, disapproval, return without recommendation, or request for more time within 60 days of the referral, unless otherwise ordered by federal, state laws, or city ordinances. <coughs> Requests for more time must give specific reasons and require suspension of this rule. The council shall not accept any report on approval, disapproval, or return without recommendation from the committee without the report being accompanied by any public meeting notes, this is going to sound familiar, whether in draft form or finalized, where the matter was discussed, and all their documents addressed to the committee, through its staff, or to the committee's chair that was intended to the full committee, 
pertaining to the subject matter referred up until the date the matter was given approval, disapproval, or return without recommendation. To satisfy this requirement, non-electronic submissions may be kept in a designated publicly accessible place within a city municipal building, and electronic submissions can be delivered to the committee by email or by using a dedicated web page. Is there a second on the amendment? Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Can I just Please. introduce this? Yeah. Uh, this was this this has been uh, a uh, growth. <laughs> it's a it's been a it's it's this reference to committees rule has grown in an attempt to uh, accommodate many of the concerns that have been brought forward um, from f um, fellow counselors and. Uh, it, it really was trying to get an initial kernel of what I consider to be best practices into codification, which is that when the council considers a measure, discussions that took place in subcommittees or at other public bodies in the city, those discussions be submitted to the council for its consideration. We rely on these subcommittees to do much of, to do a lot of deliberation in the wordsmithing and the sausage making. So the point was to give the council, to really require that the council at least have access to those before the council votes. Uh, by the way, just in for, interestingly, the old council rules gave that practice to the subcommittees. Whatever the council had received, it was the clerk's job to give to the subcommittees. But the council never required the information to go back to the council once the subcommittees had recommended it. Interest, just interestingly noted that we believed, at least partially, in giving the information to the subcommittees. But it wasn't in the council rules that they would ever, that their discussions would ever be required to come back to the council. Um, this uh, this rule really is intended to to not to, to accommodate that best practice, but not overburden the council clerk uh, or the staff of the committees by allowing electronic delivery and um, hard copies of anything delivered to the committees to be uh, put in a, in a designated place. It doesn't have to be; they don't have to be photocopied or distributed to everybody as long as they're there and accessible. Um, so, so the, uh, this might sound familiar because it was uh, first brought up by um, Mr. Roth during our, our charter debate. And uh, many counselors, I think, um, agreed with his, uh, the spirit of his, uh, of his desire, but felt that the, such, a, uh, such a practice belongs in the council rules. And uh, I've tried to make these rules as, uh, make this as um, accommodating as possible, but still keep that kernel of a best practice in these council rules. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Carney, then Councilor Speck. Okay, um, thank you, Councilor, um, for putting this so succinctly. <laughs> really, I mean, because there's a lot, there's a lot to, to be able to reduce it to the two paragraphs is really helpful. Um, my concern is, for example, this evening we would not have been able to vote on the matter that came to us regarding the, um, the Grantham Group and the CPC without, without all those documents. And, uh, you know, not just the minutes, um, but I think a uh, um, detailed, I mean, minutes that would give us the description of the discussion, and um, I don't know whether we want to tie our hands in that way. I think that um, as counselors, we can request any any documents. We know that minutes um, by the public records law, state's public records law, are required to have any documents that are submitted uh, to committee attached to those. Um, I guess what I'm concerned about is our is restricting our ability to act on anything unless 
unless all of those documents are in our hands before we act. And we do have typically two, two meetings, I mean two readings, and um, I'm thinking that we have the ability at, at the first reading if we're dissatisfied with the amount of documentation we might have on any matter to ask by the next reading that those, uh, that documentation be there. But we, if we pass this, we're never allowed to even take a first reading, I don't think, on any matter, unless we first receive all of the, uh, all of the documentation. I know it's been a concern um, for counselors to say that, you know, they don't have the gist. But typically, we all sit on, or at least on, on the council subcommittees and can ask of our fellow counselors, what was the discussion and what were the pros and cons? It's, you know, um, again, we, we were, we're relying on someone's memory as opposed to how a particular counselor may have um, transcribed at, at the moment the uh, gist of the conversation. So I don't know, I'm hesitant. I'm not sure that we want to tie our hands in that way. Um, when we know already we are going to be required to have all of the documents um, at some point by uh, virtue of the state's public pub, public records law. So anyway, I, I, I do understand where this comes from and, um, and um, I'm not sure if it's meant for a best pra as a best practice for the council because I think as, a, as for this body we have the ability to get that information. It may, I may be, pers be more persuaded if, uh, if I'm convinced that this is something that was really necessary for the public and whether or not it has to be in existence for the public before the council um, acts on any matter. Whether the timeline is really that necessary. And, uh, Councilor Spector, you were next, and then Councilor Barch. <clears throat> I support this in spirit. Um, I have a question. I, I would imagine that tonight we could have suspended the rule. Would that have been possible? And say, look, we don't have all the documents, uh, but let's suspend the rule, and the mayor could have proceeded to just use his memory of the situation. So that would address that. I also think with, the, with technology moving so quickly, I think very shortly, some of us in this group, not me, but many of you, we could actually record all of the meetings very easily um, and send that. That could be a document that's right there if anybody wants to see it. So I think it's becoming easier to do that um, kind of thing. So I do support it. I'm a, I'm a little concerned that we're, we're layering on here with each of these and that we're, that we're trying to predict, because we could sit here and predict a lot of things that could possibly take place. And then let's go through this and see all the ways in which we can create amendments. This one I think has some validity, but I still have that concern because I have not seen this. Here's the difference. And even if I vote for this, I've not seen this as a problem. I've not, has it come up occasionally? Yes, but it's like we're addressing problems that we're trying to envision could happen or that we hear from a very small number of people because sometimes they, that they see this as this is what happened and why something didn't move forward the way they'd like to have had it move forward. In fact, in my experience, the reason it, it went the way it did was because, yeah, we heard you, we had the documents, but we didn't agree with you, right? But we did hear it. So I have not had the experience as a counselor of not having the information or requesting it when I've needed it. That said, I think I would support this, I, I, and especially if we can suspend the rule, I say there's part of me that goes, well, why not? Uh, a point of information right now, I've, I've asked uh, Al Williams of uh, Northampton Community Television to research grants that would allow us to install cameras in every public meeting room that are robotic cameras that uh, the, co the, the committee chairs would just simply turn on. It would record uh, the meetings would not, not, I mean, but record the meetings in their entirety and be available relatively soon thereafter, which might render this moot for people who want to have access to this electronically. But at this point, that doesn't exist. So. That wouldn't answer the um, the requirement for the documents that are right. attended. The, that's true. Although that, for example, would, right, um, <coughs> we've often 
received reams of paper even, mm -hmm. you know, stacks that high that would then need to either be copied and placed in a, in a or placed, at least scanned and placed in a, um, I would yeah, defer. No, you, it, they wouldn't have to be. They would have to simply be available in the public. catalog yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, those would be. Those don't require approval on a vote of, uh, of the subcommittee. But so they're required by this amendment to be required by this to be available, and they are. Yeah. Avail they're rendered available anyway. So that, I mean, just so that we're right. clear on that, that the, the 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 those materials are submitted to the clerk, and the clerk just. Uh, I think the amendment says that they need to be made available before we can act on them. Is that, is that correct? Yes, it does. Well, it's, I think the term, the issue is what counts as available. And, and that's, I don't think Council Freeman Daniels is suggesting that we would get this stack of paper on our desk and that we would have access to them if we wanted. But that's, yeah, uh, th thank you. Uh, just let me mm -hmm. encompass your earlier comment with this one, uh, and maybe yours as well, Council Spector. Um, the, uh, the idea is that something submitted that would be in hard copy, would be only a hard copy, would be put, w w since, it's, since it's a public record, it would be put somewhere in, in a, somewhere convenient in a municipal building um, and that it would be accessible prior to or in conjunction with the report from the subcommittee or from the committee rather or the multiple member body or whomever uh, saying approve, disapprove, recommend, so on and so forth. Um, so that that's the uh, that's the issue, and I think that's I think the point is that we really the, the point of writing it this way is that the council cannot require the planning board to send its minutes to to the to to the council. We don't approve them in our ever in our council uh, uh, proceedings. They get approved separately, uh, and the same with conservation commission and so on. We can't require them to send those to us, but um, this says that any recommendation that they are going to make, would we wouldn't accept it unless they sent the minutes. So it is, I think, a matter for the public because they know that, and it really is a matter because the public, the public doesn't, it's very difficult to follow a, 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 a bill through committee. Um, the, the, you have to go to one website to find out whether it's at the DPW or it's at planning and how long it's at planning and when it gets referred back, it goes to the council and gets referred again. It's very diff difficult for a member of the public to do that and it's very difficult to get a member of the public to continuously follow an, an issue. And um, I, think, I think we really are accommodating the public when we say that when you come to any meeting where this matter is being discussed, it will, it will eventually get attached and eventually become accessible to the councilors before they vote. And I think that's the key here. And, and, and that's, and, and the best practice issue, it, it, are, we, are we creating, or is, there, is there a phantom menace? Um, I think take. that, that the, the, um, the issue is, ha has to do with not so much this council and its committees, but all the other multiple member bodies that the council relies on but doesn't see all okay. their proceedings. Um, was it to that point? It's to this point Barton specifically. Said, okay. To this. Sure, go ahead. I, it's a question. Can I address it to the council? Councilor, you, you um, did research on the other piece. Did you look at whether other towns and cities, while you were doing this, have this kind of rule? Just no, out of I, curiosity. I, I can't. I can't. Uh, I, I no, no, it's okay. I just, <laughs> just thought, no, really. If you did, I thought it would be curious to know. Sorry. Okay. Council Barge? Yes. Um, I have some concerns. Oh with the amendment that you want to put forth. I'm very uncomfortable. <coughs> and the reasons for that is because of delays of many minutes from other committees. We could be w really waiting two months, sometimes three months, for minutes to come forth. So, and hearing from our council president in regards to a new system apparently that might come forth where chairs of committees would just come into a room and turn on a switch, who does the minutes? Well, if that's a question directed to me, that, that would have to be determined by the committee of the minutes. There have to be written minutes according to Mass General Law. Right. 
the video document will qualify as a record of the, of the meeting, but that still at the same time um, minutes have to be kept for that. So it still would be a duty of whoever is on that committee to make sure after it's recorded that minutes are done. Right, and I think the minutes would be not have to be as detailed as they are in some cases. I think they just reflect the vote yeah. and attendance and, and the, uh, the order of agenda. Um, also, to another point that Councilor Freeman Daniels brought up, one of the things that we're looking into, and actually Councilor Freeman Daniels and I started this in the beginning of my term, and it's kind of dropped it, but it was a, a tracking system in order for the councilors and, more importantly, the public can track the process of an ordinance or, or an order. Right. And, it's, and so they could see where it was going, where it was coming next, where it was sitting, what the recommendations were. And there's actually relatively simple devices that are available online. And now that the city is moving towards uh, uh, the cloud, as it were, there are a number of tools available for us. There's some models for that, but that would hopefully work in conjunction. So right now, what we're we're in kind of flux. We're in a situation where, where the challenges that were described by Mr. Ro <coughs> Mr. Roth and that are being described now, may be functionally addressed and effectively addressed as we get as and if we get the technology. Um, this order actually addresses the interim period for the most part the the challenges are associated with it and and the challenges that Councilor Carney talked about, <coughs> about uh, trying to vote on something without necessarily having we don't know what for instance the nature of the debate at the at the CPC and fortunately the mayor had some recognition of it but uh, consequently we wouldn't have had it and you're still you still have the floor yeah thank you <clears throat> um. I have some concerns with that. To me, as a counselor, just like at our, on our council floor, I've had the minutes sent here from the Committee on Disabilities to keep counselors afloat of what is being done on that committee. And I cannot see why we would have a problem asking for minutes the Board of Health, the Planning Board zoning. I think if we requested it, we should not have a problem of getting them. That's my feelings. Um, Just to reiterate, we can always suspend the rule if there's a press if there's a matter of pressing significance. Uh, we just we would suspend the rule and be able to vote without having the minutes sent. Uh, or the or the the not even the minutes the minutes whether in draft form or not sent over um, and uh, so so that's that's the first point uh, the second point is you know I think Mr. Roth did have a good point which is that um, you want this to be sent on you want this to become a common practice not something that one counselor is always asking to have happen and then the, that counselor distributes it to everyone you want it to become a common practice it, it really is a best practice i think uh so i think it's i think that codifying it is is important thank you um i'd like to have a <coughs> sense of what um the increased workload this might present um and maybe i could hear from yeah, the I, council I, clerk I, actually uh, uh i would accept a motion recognize the council clerk so Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Mary, you're being. <laughs> you're on the hot seat. And you need a, you need a you want microphone. To turn, is that on? She has a mic. She has a table mic here. Tap it. Tap it. Uh. Okay. It's hot. Ask away. Mary, um, could you tell us just from your cursory look at this uh, rule change, what you think the increased workload might present for you? Um, I'm, I'm going to defer to the city clerk, who has given me huge advice about a lot of the charter changes, that it is increasing the workload um, every day. 
but what I could see from what this is suggesting, just offhand, <coughs> is that whether I had it electronically or in hard, um, hard copy, how would each of you get to the office or the place and have the time to see all of that? Because all of you are, have other lives other than what you have here. So it might be available in one place, whether on the website or in one place, but how would each of you get that? And what if everyone saw it, but Councilor Freeman Daniels didn't and could sit here tonight and say, well, I haven't seen any of that, so I don't want to go forward. That's what I envision, is that even if you got all of this in one central place, how would each of you all get that? Right now, if someone sends me something and it's important to an ordinance you're going to do, mm -hmm. I copy it to all of you. And maybe you see it or maybe you come to the meeting and, and but but you've got access to it. I, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it might almost be harder because it's all at the clerk's office. But do each of you have time to come to the clerk's office and read through whatever? What, what if it's like the Middle Street issue, for instance? There were people sending emails every single day when they knew it was coming to council. Sometimes 10 a day were coming, every single resident wanted to be heard. Mm -hmm. So, do I then hard copy it to all of you, or do I have it in the office? And then each of you has to responsibly come in and look through all of that. I, that's what I could foresee. Um, okay, I, um, I do think that Councillor Freeman Daniels' um, amendment addresses the issue of emails that come directly to the clerk in the sense that it's really only those that are sent to a subcommittee chair or to the presiding officer that are required to then be somehow made available to the public. It's, it's really being made available to the public, not more so even than the, the council. Um, I guess what I'm, I'm just thinking about, not just the council clerk, but the other city staff from the board, of, you know, from the Department of Public Works, whoever staffs that board, planning office the, who staffs that bo board, and the Conservation Commission, and the Tree Committee, and every other committee, really um, does need to make sure that whatever, I, I'm not so concerned with, with the minutes, but it's really the, um, all of the documents that might come, and who's going to actually take those and carry them. I know it does, ha they do eventually have to be made available. What I'm a little concerned about is having our hands tied by being able to act on anything until they're made available. I agree. And it, you know, I do, I, I do agree that they, they actually need to be made. They're, they're, we're already required by, the, by law to make these available and to have them available. What, we, what we're doing with this law is preventing any action without those being made available first. And I would envision that there would at least be a suspension of rules at least once at every meeting. And, um, you know, I, I just don't know that, we, that it's a necessary rule. I, do th I understand where it's come from. I don't know that it's necessary. And um, I'll leave it at that. Councilor Spector and then Councilor Schwartz. It's okay, because the Councilor okay, Councilor Schwartz. I, I would concur with Councilor Carney. Um, and to some part of what Councillor Spector said, which is that I feel like we are creating extra layers, and um, and I think that they are not necessarily in furtherance of the the information sharing that we're all after. I mean, I, I just I feel the burden of it, and I think that we can have a the shared goal of of maximizing our communication and our our the the flow of information without putting this rule and this across the board um, obligation, as it were. I mean, I understand we can do the exceptions, we can ask for, um, you know, in this instance it doesn't apply, but it just feels, it, it feels cumbersome and I will oppose it. Councilor Tacey. <clears throat> I just get really sensitive to the amount of work that we do put on the courts. I mean, it's not, um, as Wendy or Mary, they don't have an extra hour 
in every day. It, 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 we keep more and more and more. We keep putting more and more and more stuff on the staff, and then we don't give them any more staff. I, that makes me nervous. Um, she's been here how many hours today? So I, I don't know. I, I'm getting sensitive to the fact that there is probably not enough staff for the continuing workload that we dump on them. And, uh, and it just, I don't know, it just seems, uh, I, I get nervous. Um, to, to that point? Just to that point, that, the only part of, that I added is that all the subcommittees of the council and all the multiple member bodies, which our clerk does not staff, have to send on our minutes, send on the minutes. And, and public and public records we already had the council for I don't know how many years had already been requiring the clerk to send everything the council received to those subcommittees okay and no one ever said this is an extra layer this is a problem only when we require the subcommittees to send the information back is it now a problem it's boggling to me uh, council the barge I'm very happy with the system we have right now. I just feel we're just adding on more of a problem here. And I have to agree with Councillor Tacey in regards to more work being placed on the clerk, our city clerk. And I'm, I'm going to be very serious just even talking to Wendy Mosna today because I had to call her in regards for some information for a resident they are straight out in her office they lost a position last year right now they're going to be interviewing for another person who has left and she said like more work is coming into her office I think our council clerk and I'm going to commend her because I mean our city clerk because she has she does the minutes she has volunteer to do that otherwise some of the committees would be put into a predicament because being a chair and attempting to do the minutes is very very difficult my question is why I am worried about a lack of time of getting the information and I'm I see it all the time it takes many many months to get minutes so why should we have to hold back something that could be of importance because we have to wait for those minutes to come councillor Adams I move the question Question that calls to move the question. Second. Second it too. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. This is on the amendment. Um, at the strike thirty one and replace with the language submitted. Um, roll, call. roll call vote. Okay. Yes. Aye. No. Councillor Murphy? No. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Schwartz? No. Councillor Tacey? No. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? No. Councillor Clark? No. Five, six, nine. Uh, the amendment fails. <clears throat> any other amendments? Any other discussion? Councillor Green. One piece of discussion. I introduced reprimand. Uh, in Another rule about reprimand at the ordinance committee said that I'd introduce it to uh, It was very difficult for me to get some of the comments that the counselors uh, put in to there, so I, I did not introduce it. I'm not going to introduce it today. And, uh, I guess if, if anyone breaks the council rules, that's just the way it is. Is that an article of censure you were talking about? It was a reprimand, a reprimand. actually. Yeah. But uh, it, it it was there's just discussion about how there's just too much I, I couldn't take all the comments and and uh, put them in a crucible that made anything good so 
It's a it's a tough question, and it, and it came up uh, locally, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe at some point we'll find an opportunity to address that, especially. One more comment on that, actually. Uh, in reviewing some of the other council rules, they uh, they do a few of them do have a man at arms that uh, can escort councilors from the uh, council floor if they become unruly. You might want to think about it when the mayor is not well, doing anything. I happen to know the chief of police <laughs> is the only person in the city who watches all these meetings. And that, <laughs> he would, he would, he would I, I, I guarantee you that uh, within an instant in. of uh, somebody screaming help, there would be a man at arms showing up or a uh, council crime. I think at, at our ordinance committee meeting, I think the notion of a um, reprimand rule or even an article of censure was, um, was really received uh, well, but um, I, I agree that I, I don't think we have the time to. And I appreciate your offering to put it together. Um, but what I would say is that if we were to accept the, these rules tonight, that does not in any way limit our ability to add another rule, even as early as next week. I, I would, I, I think that would be well worth considering. I think it's very important that it's, it's represented itself a couple of times, and it would, and you stamped that you have a mechanism in place, and then so. Um, any other amendments on these? Any other discussion on the amendments? Hearing none, I'm going to call, ask the clerk to call the roll for approval of the council rules as submitted and amended. Councilor Barge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Casey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Craven Daniels? Nay. Tempted to rule you out of order. <laughs> <laughs> Capriciously. <laughs> uh, all right. We're inconsistent. Again, uh, Councilor Adams. And actually, and I should say to the Ordinance Committee, thank you very, all very much for the work that you, uh, that you put to this. Despite the fact that you say it wasn't arduous, this has been months in the development and with, with great consideration. I really appreciate it. And I also appreciate the debate we just had. So, Mr. President. Councilor Tacey. I'd like to chime in. Everybody else did. There you go. Um, may I beg the Council's permission to... Uh, to leave, I'm, I'm not as you can hear. I'm not feeling all that well. The rest of the, the meeting, second I don't. Readings on, uh, second readings on second readings, and um, if you could, if there are any questions on Henshaw, if you know he's not feeling well. He he voted with me a lot of times here. <laughs> I did. I voted with him. It's clearly delusional. Yes, you should go hallucinating. <laughs> <laughs> Move to excuse the counselor. <laughs> I don't think that requires a motion. Without reprimand. Uh, <laughs> counselor is excused. Before you start. Oh, okay. All right. This is uh, this is a memo f from uh, the city solicitor relative to the ordinances that are looming. Uh, the following with regard to the ordinance is attached to your email, and you'll actually attach here in the package. Ed Lou, in my opinion, neither the mayor nor the mayor's designee may serve on a committee of the city council. The most uh, fundamental change made to the city's form of government by the adoption of the new charter and is the separation of powers. Having the mayor on such a council committee is inconsistent with the edict that the legis quote, the legislative branch shall never exercise any executive power and the executive branch shall never exercise any legislative power, section 1-3. And the power of appointment to council committees is an essential legislative power reserved for, to the council president. Uh, then the historical commission the revisions to the ordinance would violate provisions of general law, Chapter 40, Section 4J. The statute, <coughs> excuse me, limits membership on an historical commission to seven. I've informed Wayne Fiden that I cannot approve this ordinance as to form, and he's working on uh, further revisions to make it compliant with uh, Section 4J. And then on the, the on the on the COD on the. Con on the Council on Disabilities, these revised ordinance, this, the, these revised ordinance, that's not correct, that's yes. a, this, this revised ordinance is in proper form, he says. 
So with that, and that is submitted into the public record as well. We move on. And this is uh, on the ordinance. This is upon the recommendation of Council Owen Freeman Daniels and Council William H. Dwight. Uh, the ordinance to amend the Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use membership. This is in the second Herb. reading. Second. A discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call. Roll. Need a roll call. I'm sorry. Roll call. Good point. Thank you. Mary caught it first. Okay. <laughs> Yes. Can I just say again, I, I'm going to repeat what I said before. I believe all council committees should be part of the council rules and orders, but since they're an ordinance, then. And we will, and we will have an opportunity to discuss that actually soon, and we're going to try and work that out. And uh, made a good point that we, we have to, there's some, some closet cleaning we've got to do here. So, but on this order, uh, the roll call. Council Murphy? Yes. Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Barnes? Yes. That passes in second reading. Next up is the, upon the recommendation of Council All the Spectre. This is second reading. This is, uh, <clears throat> I move uh, two and ordinances two and three as a group. There's a motion to second. Okay. Move as a group. All those in favor of moving the next two orders? Aye. 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 All right. So it's on street and off street handicapped parking spaces on Henshaw Avenue and no parking certain times on Henshaw Avenue. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Do you need roll calls? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm just going to form. Yes, sorry. Councilor Schwartz. Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Aye. Councilor Barnes? Yes. Councilor Murray? Yes. Okay. So this is second reading for um, to delete the planned unit development and amend open space residential development to incorporate uh, uses previously allowed as PUD. Move to second reading. Second. second. Well, Discussion on this. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. yes. Well, Mary's got to readjust the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Barnes? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. That is passed in second reading. The next up is uh, second reading for to rezone densely developed residential properties between Barrett Street and Bridge Road from URB to URC. Reflect on use in second reading. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All right, Mary. Good luck. Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Dan? Aye. Council yes. Council Murphy? Yes. Council Schwartz? Yes. Council Tacey? Yes. All right. This is uh, to amend 2230 to 2234. Move, move to postpone indefinitely. There's a motion to postpone the ordinance indefinitely. Second. And it's been seconded. What's that? And I suppose that, well, no. Which one? It's debatable. No, what do we suppose? It's, it's debatable. Roll call okay, roll call to suspend. No, I don't. Because this is not actually uh -huh. adopting if so. we're suspending. So I'm going to do a voice well, vote. Uh, um, oh. can, we, can we hear what, for why we want to uh, suspend indefinitely? Can I speak? Um, pursuant to the, uh, to the um, solicitor's uh, memo, uh, this this has to be rewritten before it's brought back to the council. Um, so I think that it would be best to have the uh, staff rewrite it, bring it to the historic commission and, and historic district again. Uh, and if, but if they don't want to bring it, that's fine, and they just bring it back again from staff instead of from those commissions. According to the city solicitor, this is not does not abide by general law. Yeah. Thank you. 
so the motion is to postpone indefinitely. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. <coughs> All right. This is the Committee on Disabilities. Uh, Move to refer to ordinance. Isn't this number eight? Six. I'm sorry. This seven. Is, this is number eight. Uh, this is seven. yes, and this is to. Uh, or, or is this, this number seven? Seven. seven. Yes. So number seven. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. This is to refer to the committee on election rules and ordinances, orders and plans. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Oh. Councilor Green. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I guess this will get worked out in ordinance, um, but I, I don't see the solicitors. I don't understand the solicitor's reasoning on this, but I, I, I but the solicitor will be at ordinance. So I guess it'll get worked out in ordinance. I, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. Uh, Councilor Adams, you want to? He didn't explain it. Right. So there's no reason. Right. There's nothing to understand really. It's, it was a one sentence. It, it passes legal muster and nothing else. I hope I, to find out the same thing in ordinance. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the motion is to refer. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Okay. This is uh, to refer lang uh, language regarding home occupation be amended to consistent with current home business classification to be referred to planning board, ed lieu, and, uh, and an ordinance. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, I, I move that we refer 8 and 12 as a group. Uh, there's been a motion to uh, to move the remaining uh, Second. to 12 as a group. To planning board, uh, Ed Lou, and ordinance. So same referral. There was a second on that. All those in favor of moving these as a group? Aye. 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 Opposed? Standing? Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. The... So now the now the topic is there's there's a there's a motion to uh, refer these to the committees. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So that's eight through twelve. That brings us up to uh, the community preservation committee powers and duties, which is to be referred to uh, ordinance. Move to refer. Second. Councilor Freeman Daniels. Uh, I guess this will get worked out in ordinance as well. With the, with the yeah. Mm -hmm. That that would be our hope. Why we send it there. Uh, all those in favor of referring? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? My good folks, we're getting, we're about to put a period at the end of the sentence. I have no updates. Um, are there any new chairs that wish to update? Any new business? I'll accept the motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all.